Good morning. Uh, today is uh, Wednesday, January 24th. It's 9 a.m. And this is a special joint meeting of the, uh, <clears throat> the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee and the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We're here to talk this morning about housing and regulatory reform. Um, we're coming up, I think it's April 4th, is the 54th anniversary of Act 250 passing. So it has for us stood the state in good stead for uh, helping do a lot of the planning and development that we often all refer to as smart growth. Um, we also know that a law that's 54 years old in a state that's changed a great deal in four years in between, especially at the regional and municipal planning level, um, uh, is it's always worth reviewing and seeing if we can make improvements. So with that, do you want to help kick us off? We have, an, oh, just a, another quick logistical note. So we have a lot of witnesses today. Um, uh, Chair Rumhimsdale and I talked about it a little bit. We're, we're not going to do questions until, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll get to a Q&A time. I'm gonna make. <laughs> other than... No, I don't think so. They like diverting attention. Yes, yeah. yes. We have 16 witnesses, so we're going to be marching right along. People have roughly 10 minutes, and um, I'm sure we'll learn a lot from all those folks. Uh, anything else you'd like to add this morning? Uh, well, a, a couple things. I think that also means we'll try to have a, a very short bio break somewhere in here. And your chair, a man after my own heart, has <laughs> written it in. Um, but if you need to use the restroom or get up and, and do something, please feel free to do that. Um, so I am Chair Keisha Ram Hinsdale uh, from Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs. And I don't know the last time these two committees had a joint hearing, um, but I think it's incredibly fitting, um, not just in exploring the dual housing and climate crises, we face generally, but in the aftermath of a flood that has left many people without adequate housing or living in unsafe conditions. I was just looking at some data from the World Economic Forum about the lung, respiratory, and other illnesses that are tracked post flood um, in a lot of areas that see frequent flooding and the toll on people's well being. Um, and the economy are both tremendous when we think about climate vulnerability. Um, we know in Vermont that our climate vulnerability really lands most squarely on rural seniors who are trying to find somewhere to live, allows them to access health care and quality of life easily and gets them out of very large single family homes that um, could be turned over for larger families that want to grow and expand. Um, so I just think it's really fitting, not only in the aftermath of the flood, but because when economy and environment are pitted against each other, Vermonters lose, people lose. Um, so it is really incumbent upon us to be working together to figure out how we meet the moment of the climate reality that we're in and how we advance housing access for everyone that is safe, warm, and close to places that they live, work, and play. Um, so with that, uh, I think one more logistical note is just so people watching know, we each uh, picked eight <coughs> witnesses from our committees and um, you know, we'll take turns introducing folks unless you want to do it, which is also fine. Yeah, I thought well, we might get a call on people so we okay. can keep going. Just make right. a general request, which is, yeah. could you use your diaphragms to project here? Because it's a long way from our witnesses to people hearing all the way in the back. So, and there's no microphone. So I would encourage us all to use our big indoor voices. Follow Senator Clarkson's lead. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what's the goal of this meeting? <clears throat> Well, I, I'll speak for uh, Senator Ram Himsdale and I talked about it. I, I'll jump right to sort of the bottom line in a little bit. We we often have the committees take a different view of uh, growth and development, regulation, impact on the environment. And rather than last year, we went through, I think, a difficult process whereby the Economic Development Committee brought forward a bill that then we responded to. So rather than have us going in sequence, we thought it would be more productive for all of us 
to have the conversation in parallel, even if it's the fills might sequence in, in, in that way, like similar to last year. But if we have the conversation in parallel all the way along, we can stay better apprised of how each committee is looking at the same overarching issue. I've asked Magali to share a visual because I think it speaks more highly than I can about why we're here. Um, at some point, you know, our job is to develop housing and commercial activity that keeps our state vital. And, you know, Act 250, uh, as I understand it, was originally intended to focus on land use. And where we know the land use is residential, commercial, industrial, we need to be able to build densely to really fulfill the ultimate principle of Act 250, which is compact village settlement with working lands around it. And so with our shared jurisdictions, I think we need to look at the flow chart of permits and all of the places that you can get sent back to go or you know, get appealed into perpetuity um, or have one person in charge of decision making that can stop dense affordable housing and appropriate commercial activity from happening where we've already designated the land use uh, for such activity. So, you know, I think the other reality that I, I like to highlight about Act 250 is we talked about it as something once upon a time where you could have this conversation on your front porch so that you encouraged smart development, not so that you went all the way to the Supreme Court to stop development. And so Act 250, I think, has become um, the symbol for what has strayed from its original intention to create density where it belongs. So or create development. <clears throat> I think so this, this meeting is about Act 250. It's not about what's standing in the way of housing for Vermonters. Well, I would say any any obstacle, what's game for, I'm hoping that our witnesses will help us understand. Act 250 is maybe the, the most the largest, most visible object for discussion, but it's certainly not the only thing. So I'm hoping that we'll have any any of our witnesses who see other uh, aspects of developing housing, uh, anything impacting them, that we'll hear about them and get them all on the table. And I would also say we have put into play with our legislation of the last couple of years, a number of uh, legs to the stool that we're hoping will support updating and reforming uh, all the barriers that we face with housing and uh, and and uh, protecting our environment. And you, one leg of that stool are Charlie and Catherine, the planners. So we have this exciting uh, mapping and planning update. We have the designations and we have the Act 250 reforms. Act 250 isn't the only issue with housing and the environment. We have many other issues and where it needs to be we need to green light it is what I think Charlie and Catherine are going to be addressing and what we, uh, so I think it's the bringing all those pieces together, which will <clears throat> give us a, a cleaner, easier, simpler way to understand, to green light uh, where develop, where we, what we save. Essentially, we we've, we've asked experts to tell us what's getting in the way of housing and we're here to listen to yeah. them. And one expert that I, I had called on, they're coming to our committee, and I hope you'll hear them as well, is the Pew Charitable Trust. They've been following all the laws across the country that have uh, loosened up housing and rental vacancy. And where you find a healthy re rental and homeownership vacancy rate, you find low rent increases and low homelessness. Right. And they can spell that out across the country. So we face both our unique rural challenge in Vermont, but we also face a national housing crisis that has very clear data-informed solutions, right. and we're here to talk about that. Um, one thing Senator Ron Pimsdale mentioned was, uh, you know, the, the notion of looking at if energy, the environment, and economy aren't uh, opponents, and that is an old yes. You can go back through numerous uh, gubernatorial <clears throat> addresses. You know, but each governor comes along and says the same thing; they go hand in hand. Um, and so I think we're always trying to remember that and figure it out. Um, it's a long time ago, but Governor Davis's original formulation for who was on a district commission was someone from the business community, someone from the environmental community, and an upstanding citizen. <laughs> so uh, it, it was always about a, a more different voices at the table. And with that, it's a perfect time to hear 
Mr. Baker's voice. Um, thank you. That's, uh, I don't know if I could follow up on all of that, uh, but thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie Baker. I'm the executive director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, this is my normal room speaking okay. voice. Um, but I'm here today testifying both on behalf of the Chittenden County RPC and the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies, uh, which is the State Association of Regional Planning Commissions. Uh, personally, I've been a professional planner in Vermont for more than 15 years and more than 35 years in total. Um, and one thing over that long time, which I hesitate to write that down, but one thing that experiences upon me is that our land use regulations absolutely do influence developer behavior. So we can see that we had a housing construction boom in the 60s, 70s, you know, and it lasted into the 80s, right? Because things were grandfathered, Act 250 didn't really take effect or have full effect until probably we started getting to the 90s. But we had a housing growth rate of about 2%, which is part of the reason I think we got Act 250, like, whoa, things are moving too fast. There's too much change happening in our communities. However, we maybe turned the dial too far and so the last couple of decades, we've been less than half a percent growth rate. Um, and just in the long time that I've been working in, in different places, um, a healthy growth rate is closer to around 1%. Um, so I'm just, I have that in the back of my mind as I think about this. Um, so how do we get to kind of a healthier growth rate for housing? Uh, well, first I'd like to thank uh, the committees for supporting the language in S100 to have us do these studies around Act 250, the designation program, and regional planning. Um, and I believe there are four broad goals that those studies taken together uh, will help us achieve. Uh, one is smart plan growth by encouraging more housing in the right places. Uh, and part of that is by reducing regulatory redundancy. Um, stronger natural resource protection. So back to this growth and uh, environmental conservation happen at the same time. But resource protection for flood resilience, our rural character, and achieving our carbon reduction goals. So we're achieving multiple goals here. Number three is reinvestment in our downtowns and village centers by making it easier to get state designations and increasing reinvestment in those cherished places. And the fourth one is a more general one about getting more consistency and certainty in the local and regional planning and, and state regulatory systems. So helping the system work together better because uh, it's been cobbled together over the last 50 years um, without necessarily all the updates to the system. Um, so we have planning, we have regulation and permitting, and we have investment, right? So planning, regional planning commissions, regulation, permitting, Act 250 is a part of, but not the whole thing. And sorry, I'm looking at Sabina. <laughs> and, and to your point, Chair Bray, I think Act 250 is often used as a euphemism for all of the permitting in the yeah. state. <laughs> and so I hope um, people kind of keep that in mind. Oftentimes, we're not just talking about Act 250, or maybe there may be something else uh, indeed. Um, but, but all of this, the planning, the regulations, and the permitting that goes with that, and the investments are part of how the legislature has put into place policy to help implement our municipal and regional plans, right? So you require us to do regional plans. Most of our municipalities do plans. And our regulatory system ought to be helping us achieve what those plans are calling for. So Act 250 has been a positive regulatory system for Vermont over the years and has done a lot, certainly um, on the environmental uh, and rural character side. However, there are opportunities to make it better. I'm here this morning to ask you to review and support the recommendations from the Regional Planning Act 250 and designation studies, and I'm purposefully mentioning them together as a group. Um, we obviously, the RPCs were responsible for the regional planning report, and we worked closely with the Act 215 designation study efforts to have the three studies align and mutually support each other. Uh, and taken together, the recommendations of the three studies help do help better align our planning regulation and investments to better achieve our municipal, regional, and state goals. And how do they do that? Um, and you already started to touch on this at the uh, in your introductory comments. But one of the weaknesses of Act 250 has been the lack of the map to guide permitting decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the state has had conversation over those decades about um, a state map. Um, but I think our recommendation is rather than do doing a new state mapping process, let's build on what we already have, which is the regional planning commission maps. Um, but to do that, we need to update and provide consistent mapping 
so that there's a strong foundation for actually 50 reviews and designation investments. Um, this will provide uh, increased review in important natural resource areas and decreased review in planned growth areas that have infrastructure and good zoning. This is where our plans call for housing growth and the municipalities determine the details of land use density and design through their zoning. Um, so, and there's, there are the people dealing with the neighbors, right? Um, uh, which I think is an appropriate responsibility for the municipalities. Last year, you adopted S100, which focused on municipal zoning to increase housing in areas with infrastructure. Um, this year is a time to update Act 250 to support municipalities in achieving what was required of them last year. Uh, municipalities in all parts of Vermont should be able to have some planned growth so that not all the growth is concentrated in and around Chittenden County. Uh, as a group, the RPCs want towns in all of our regions to be healthy and prosperous. Uh, so the state RPCs are recommending the statutory language that would make our regional plans more consistent in our future land use planning, including delineating the areas that meet designation program requirements and have the potential to meet criteria established by the NRB to achieve exemption from Act 250. The designation program is proposing to simplify the designations from five to three designations. The NRB is recommending a three-tier system in which we are clear that we are trying to encourage growth in the first tier, our planned growth areas, and we are clear about tier three area, uh, trying to preserve those natural resources uh, and get a higher level of review at Act 250. Um, in the regional planning report, we call that uh, conservation, uh, rural conservation areas. Um, and I did put a graphic in front of all of you. You can see how these relate. Uh, and thank you to the Department of Housing and Community Development for developing this. Uh, so even though I'm acting like it's mine, I can produce it. Um, but um, and you can see how these uh, relate. Um, and really, uh, we're not, and I'm just going to kind of address kind of the elephant in the room. I don't think this is about weakening Act 250, but rather strengthening to better accomplish the state's goals. Um, you know, I'm not sure they were really, um, even as much review does happen there, that we're really accomplishing what we want to do in terms of rural protection through the Act 250 process right now, uh, really due to where the jurisdictional thresholds are. Um, there's also a report that we prepared about how we can make, uh, how, how it could work for high capacity municipalities to obtain a delegation agreement from the NRB after demonstrating that their regulations are functionally equivalent to Act 250. I recommend reviewing that report for an, another option to consider. Um, and finally, uh, it, creating greater alignment between our plans, regulations, and incentive programs will greatly enhance our ability as a state to achieve our shared goal. We'd be happy to provide, provide more detail about these issues in public testimony and thank you for your consideration and I won't ask for any questions because I know you have a lot of witnesses. Thank you very much and you have a great sense of timing that was about 10 <laughs> minutes on almost <clears throat> I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so next up please I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Zeke Davison Chief Operating Officer of Summit Properties. Good morning can you all see and hear me? Yes we can thank you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Again, Zeke Davison, Summit Properties. We're the largest private developer of um, mixed income and affordable housing in the state of Vermont. Uh, I uh, appreciate being invited today. I, I testified to economic development last week, uh, so I've seen a lot of you recently, but obviously met all of you as S100 was going through the uh, legislature last year. So I'll hopefully beat 10 minutes here. Uh, I want to try to make some market-related points and tie them back into some Act 250 policy-related points. And if there's any group of people that I can say that sentence to without completely glossing over, it's you all. Um, so Keisha, uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale uh, referenced this earlier, and hopefully you'll have the few charitable trust uh, talk to you all. But there's a lot of research that demonstrates that homelessness and housing affordability are, are directly correlated uh, to rent vacancy rate, right? Which is just a measure of empty units. And, and a healthy housing market, common wisdom is Needs a vacancy rate of around 5%. Vermont's closer to 2%. It's been under 1% in Chittenden County for much of the last three years. And, and that vacancy rate is really driven by a supply and demand curve. When there's low supply, there's not a lot that sits empty. Prices go up. Homelessness goes up. Um, and our vacancy rate is skewed because we simply don't have enough supply of housing units to create a healthy housing market right now, uh, which has you know, led to some of the homelessness and the housing cost burden we've seen. So uh, that's all the precursor to, to why don't we have enough homes, right? There, there are a lot of reasons, uh, and one of which is that for the last 50 years, we've, we've made it hard to develop in Vermont. It's, it's a policy decision. 
It was a, it was a preservation of our state at a time, like Charlie said, of, of um, uh, uncontrolled growth. Uh, and it was a trade-off to preserve rural agrarian open spaces and prevent spall. We love this about Vermont. This is uniquely Vermont. We all we all cherish that that brand and and what Act 250 has done for Vermont. Um, but we also find ourselves today so far behind, generationally behind, on housing supply. Um, and market conditions have shifted so quickly in the last five years uh, that ex you know housing costs and homelessness have have exploded, and we really don't have a path to combating that right now with subsidy, with, with money. Um, our homelessness rates are second highest in the country. We're on par with major urban states, New York, California, District of Columbia. Um, and unfortunately, this is really also now becoming a reality that's uniquely Vermont. Um, and at its core, this is a policy trade-off. And it's and it's luckily one that, that the legislature can address. Uh, in areas where towns want growth, where they're ready for growth, where they've gone through the democratic, democratic process to codify growth and what that should look like, um, we have really one meaningful policy lever that isn't subsidy uh, that can give supply a, a better chance, a fighting chance here, and that's and that's reduction or elimination of Act 250 jurisdiction in those areas. Um, so I made all these arguments in front of your two committees last year on behalf of S100. Uh, the Act 250 provisions of that bill, Charlie mentioned, that became a municipal um, bill. The Act 2, there were a few Act 250 provisions, um, but they became really narrow, and they did meaningfully impact one project that's going through the state right now and going through permitting. And that's that's one of ours. It's a 200 unit mixed income master plan community uh, in Middlebury that we're, we're going through the permitting process on. Um, but so I kind of use that today as a sample size of one, which is better than a sample size of, of nothing as we talk about this. Uh, so because of S100 and because of the work done by the town of Middlebury, we're ready to break ground this year. Um, if that legislative change had not been made, the project would be smaller in scope or we would have you know, it was altogether too risky for us to, to invest the pre-development costs and also importantly for VHFA and VHCB to invest their subsidy resources in. So the trade-off of risk and margin really would not have been worth it on that project. And even if we decided to move forward on that project um, with Act 250 jurisdiction, we would certainly not be breaking ground this year. Um, so one common reaction I, I do want to uh, address that I get whenever we talk about Act 250 and, and smart growth is, wait, you can't pin all this on Act 250. It's, it's, this, it's not the only driving force here. Um, and I've sort of struggled always with how to respond to that uh, because it's both true, uh, but I think it's some, at the same time, it kind of avoids some of the responsibility of Act 250. Um, we have enough land in Vermont to house all Vermonters. Uh, we've, we've made it too difficult or we've chilled the use of that land altogether in the name of, of um, this character, the character of Vermont that we're trying to preserve. And it sort of is a false choice. Uh, and it's created these market conditions that, that are on par with the challenges of major urban centers. But, but developers can't get urban center rentals or sales prices. We don't have the incomes to support that. We build less. Um, here we are. So, uh, the legislature this year can make a policy decision to help developers, large and small. You know, for by Vermont standards, we're a pretty large developer. But the ones that are, you know, the developers that are toying with that, do I build eight units? Do I build 12 units? Do I build 20 units? Um, that you can help developers make the same decision that S100 has let us make. Proceed with a smart growth, town-supported housing project that the state desperately needs. Um, you know, the, the, the major changes were punted, as Charlie said, <laughs> this session. And those are really being proposed now. Um, I think the uh, the elimination of, of Act 250 jurisdiction in meaningfully drawn tier one areas um, where the towns want the growth, there's been a democratic process for imagining what that growth is going to look like, uh, is really the least we can do on the policy side to be to be serious about turning the tide on, on housing supply here in Vermont. And I hope we can do this really soon and, and uh, appreciate what you are all doing to, to take a serious look at this again this year. So I beat 10 minutes. Uh, thank you all. And uh, appreciate you guys all sitting in the room today to, to talk about this. Uh, thank you so much. Um, with that, I'd like to go to Catherine Dimitrik, who's the chair of the Vermont Association and Development Agency. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Again, I'm Catherine Dimitrik. I'm director of Northwest Regional Planning Commission, and I'm chair of the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies. It's pretty cool to be a part at a place in my career where I can say way back when, when I started. So 30 years ago, um, when I started, 
we were definitely at a place that people were referenced where growth was at a scary level. In Grand Isle County, we grew 30% in a decade. That's just crazy amounts of growth when you think about what's happening now. Our schools were at capacity. People were justifiably scared about what was happening in Vermont. And Act 250 really served as an important check on that. And Act 250 has been valuable for the state of Vermont. But now we're at a place where, you know, regional growth has been 5% over a decade, statewide 3%. We have a shortage of workers and housing. In Franklin and Grand Isle counties alone, we estimate there's 7,600 needed housing units in order to create an accessible and affordable housing market. And our communities now have robust regulations. When I started, some towns, most of our towns had no zoning or what they did have was still copied on a mimeograph machine. You know, things have changed a lot and we are ready for something new. I love Act 250. I just love it. Um, I remember learning about it and understanding how uniquely Vermont it was and just being so proud to be part of a state that had something like Act 250. But loving Act 250 doesn't mean that it can't change. There's a, there are some things that are wrong with Act 250 for what we need today. Act 250 regulates residential more stringently than it regulates commercial growth. It's a quite stark difference when you put it on the jurisdictional triggers for Act 250 for residential versus commercial. Act 250 doesn't care. Act 250 doesn't care about climate resilience, and Act 250 doesn't care about rewarding larger scale, well-planned, comprehensive projects. And I'm gonna give you some examples to illustrate the points. There are two projects in uh, Franklin County, I won't name the towns because one of them is still going through process, but one is a 12 unit residential development on less than two acres of land, hundreds of feet from the state designated growth center and highly walkable area. That requires Act 250 review. Permit fees alone were $7,200. And that doesn't even count the cost of actually preparing and going through the Active 50 application. Up the road, in a not a walkable area, much farther from the designated area, a development of seven commercial buildings, almost 200 parking spaces and two acres of pavement didn't require Active 50 review because it was located on less than 10 acres, just barely, but less than 10 acres. So that's a great contrast that you can see to illustrate my point about how residential is regulated much more stringently from a jurisdictional trigger perspective than commercial. And then I want to give you a couple of examples related to the Home Act that you passed last year. Assume you've got a nine acre parcel of land that has access to water and sewer. If you want to fully build that out with commercial, you're exempt from Act 250. If you want to build from an equity perspective, if you want to build eight mansions on that parcel with water and sewer, you can do that and not require Act 250. But if you want to take advantage of the Home Act provisions that were passed last year and build 45 market rate housing units that are available to our people who want to and currently live in Vermont, you have to go through Act 250. So Act 250 now is in contrast to the Home Act provisions that you passed last year. And another example, statewide, the local level now, duplexes must be uh, allowed where single family um, used to only be allowed. So you have to allow duplexes in the same place. Act 250 still counts duplexes as two units. So there's a, there's a, a hill that needs to be climbed in the Act 250 area to bring it, even to bring it into parity with the Home Act. Fortunately, as Charlie mentioned, there's some solutions that you asked us to work on last year as part of the Home Act and we have given you some recommendations from the planning perspective, the incentive perspective, and the regulatory perspective. And taken together, those, those um, recommendations can really address those issues of equity and jurisdiction. And I wanna make it clear that nothing in these studies are recommending weakening 250. Nothing is recommending weakening the standards, weakening the environmental provisions. The recommendations are to change the jurisdiction, where it applies, how it applies, when it applies. <laughs> And then finally, I would just like to say that um, I think it's time. It's time to modernize Act 250. It's Vermont's landmark environmental and development law. And I think with these changes, we can say that even more proudly that it serves Vermont now and in our future. Thank you. Oh, just for 
clear, uh, clarity. Um, when you're referring to plans uh, or reports, can you name those so that people will know what to take a look at in order to keep up with the, all the good work that's been going on? Before? Sure. And make sure they're on our websites under the appropriate subject matter. The first is the Regional Planning Commission's Future Land Use Report. The second is Designations 2050, I think it's called. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third is Necessary, necessary Updates, updates to Ag 250. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are moving right along. A rare experience for a committee to be ahead of time. Um, Maybe it's this Thank building. You. Maybe we're more disciplined <laughs> in a different space. <laughs> Um, the the other thing is for any witnesses who are uh, speaking today, if you have um, written testimony that you can share with, with us, um, if you could send that uh, to us, it'll help us create a better web page for people who want to follow up uh, or for community members who want to uh, look at the, what you brought forward. If you email them to the two committee assistants uh, for our committees, Ms. Newman and Ms. Uh, Aleman, then that would be helpful. Okay, so with that, we're up to um, Mr. Seelig, Gus Seelig, Executive Director of Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Thank you for coming in. Always good to see you. Uh, good morning. So for the record, Gus Seelig, Director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, uh, the Housing and Conservation Board stands at the cross-section of this question that Senator Ram Hinsdale talked about of land use, of both conserving the things we treasure the most and trying to build in the places that it makes the most sense. And that's a piece of why we were invented uh, back in the 1980s when the pace of development had, after that early recession, really picked up. And you're both committees of jurisdiction that oversee our work. Um, so I want to walk through this um, saying I am not an Act 250 expert. I'm a funder of projects and I have observed lots of projects lots of difficulty over the years and really want to applaud the work you did on Act 47. Um, when you sit at the local level as a, on a development review board, making your neighbors mad at you is really hard. And my own observation is human beings are not good at change, whether it's a change in their view or change in the amount of traffic they have or any of those kinds of things. So Act 47 has already netted results in the permitting of emergency shelters. Uh, this town of Waterbury um, did a reversal um, when they understood, I think, Act 47 and permitted a building in its downtown. So you're having a positive impact, and I appreciate that work. Um, there are two former mayors of Montpelier on this committee, and we have seen the great difficulty of achieving community consensus around Sabin's Pasture for all the time I've been in my job. And so it's really hard. They, the old expression of all politics is local. Um, and when you are in a neighborhood where there are people with lots of money and lots of attorneys and time on their hands, we saw in Woodstock a case take a, de a decade to work through the court system two and a half times to the Supreme Court. So your focus here is really important. I apologize um, for anything I might repeat uh, that you heard either at the... Um, session I did with Mara Collins and Sue Minter at the beginning in December, or I've already been in front of the um, Economic Development Committee. A few things that go not to Act 250, but to the general subject that you're working on. And this goes back to what Governor Dean said in his farewell address. If we don't build up, we will sprawl out. So as you do this work, anything you can do to encourage communities to allow taller buildings is a good thing. Um, recently in Windsor, Vermont, um, the community and the historic preservationists in that community, they permitted a building only because uh, the developers agreed to cut one story off. There's a historic church on the National Register down the street on the other side of the street and thought that would have a negative impact. Um, in Bristol, we just did a great project on Firehouse Lane. But I would say to you, Senator Bray, it would have been great to reopen that situation and build three-story buildings instead of two, and we would have had 30 apartments instead of 20. So think about that as you, as you do your work. 
figure out how to shorten the appeals process because whenever somebody goes to court, it takes at least two years if the appellants go all the way to Supreme Court. And in this environment, even if the cost increases go down from where they've been in double digits or last year at 7% to 3%, the basis on which costs are, are based to build housing is now so much higher that 3% ends up being a lot of money. So time is money in trying to get um, uh, housing built. And finally, uh, the, the last two things I'll say uh, is the corrective action plan process at DEC is taking people a year or more to work through. Uh, this is something I, uh, the Governor's Council on Housing and Homelessness has said, can't we cut that time in half? Um, but I hope you'll ask the administration what their plans are to speed that process up. And finally, can we use infrastructure dollars to support developers um, that are coming to us through the through the bipartisan act uh, to make to take the cost of water and sewer off of them, um, which is a big cost driver. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, all the good that I think I've seen Act 250 do over the years. Uh, Paul Brune was a great personal friend. I love being able to um, see the whale's tails at exit four. Um, and uh, we helped conserve some of the land around that as part of the ultimate settlement. I'm glad that uh, downtown Rutland has Walmart in the downtown. Um, so there's a lot of good that people have been able to do because we have Act 50. We need to acknowledge that. You'll hear from Kathy Byer in a few minutes. She's a practitioner with far more on the ground expertise um, than I have. But, but I, I want to note that one of the things that Act 250 never was able to achieve, and I, I was not around for the beginning of it, but it didn't get, the legislature failed to pass a statewide land use plan. I was around for the Act 200 debate, and the idea was bottom-up planning. Um, and I think we were invented in part um, to help protect the rural landscape because people decided 9B was not enough. And we've now conserved our friends in some nonprofit organizations, about 200,000 acres of our ag base permanently. But we decided 9B was not enough. In the same way, you invented the downtown program, downtown tax credits, and now designation programs. What I want to suggest to all of you is that I think that that's a different way at the question of having a statewide land use plan. I'm not sure Vermonters will ever accept a top down land use plan, but I think a bottom up plan where communities designate the areas they want to grow is the right approach to take. And so we've done a lot of work in the St. Albans uh, with a very entrepreneurial manager and um, city council, and they've made a decision about where they want growth to occur. And we've funded now four projects that will produce well over 100 units of housing in that designated area. So I think that's a great model in the in the reality that we're not going to have a statewide land use plan. Um, I do want to note that I think you have to consider how democracy works and when we have enough democracy. So when, when a community gets a designation, that's through a public process at the local level. It's approved by a regional planning commission and approved at the state level. And so at some point, I think we all have to ask the question, when do you then have the right to build or is everything negotiable forever between a developer and a governing body? And I think that that's a place to focus your work and to look at the reports that you're getting uh, from the regional planners um, and from the natural resources board. Of that, All of that mim mimics what you, Art Gibb, who's one of the uh, supporters and uh, sponsors of our legislation had hoped for right at the beginning when Act 250 was created. Um, I do want to note that we have had great success um, with the realities of priority housing projects, and we're doing great work in communities. And just heard from Mr. Davidson where South Burlington and Burlington adopted inclusionary zoning. And that is provided not just for market rate housing, but for affordable housing to be required as part of the package. So I'd ask you to think about as we change the system, how do you insist that communities reserve capacity, reserve land, so that some of the land, some some of that will turn into affordable housing? Because market rate housing, 
at its current price is not going to serve teachers, cops, firefighters, nurses, aides, li librarians, lots legislators. of legislators. Legislators, <laughs> yes, uh, the whole whole gamut. Um, none of the work will ultimately work uh, in terms of the market will produce market rate housing, but without funding that brings the cost down, we're not going to have what we really need for, for the working Vermonters who the governor talked about. Um, Kathy will talk more about the Act 250 process, but a couple of observations for me, which is uh, developers don't begin that process till they have all the rest of their permits. Um, and so it's not that the Natural Resources Board is um, unwilling to move things along, but it is that a developer wouldn't initiate the cost or time if they're not going to get their permits from ANR and they're not going to get their permits from the community. It, it, it just adds cost, adds risk. So that's a piece of the problem that I think you'll hear about in terms of Act 250. Um, we have seen some circumstances where people built below the threshold in order to not trigger Act 250. So again, going back to the idea that we want to designate areas, plan for areas that ought to have growth, I think that um, then allowing that growth and that density to happen so that we do protect the environment by not sprawling out is important. The, um, Act 250 was created, as other folks said, at a different time. And as somebody who graduated from college in 1976, my pals and I rented a beautiful farmhouse in North Callis for 150 bucks a month. Um, it was not a well-insulated house. We lived about eight feet from the Ashley wood stove mm -hmm. that winter. Um, got laid off in the middle of the winter, and but we made things work. A few years later, my wife and I bought a house in East Callis for $26,500. Interest rates were close to 10%. But that house at its last sale at the beginning of the pandemic went for $300,000. Um, the woman who and her boyfriend who came to buy that house, um, they split up and then she went off for another job. Her dad loves the house. So this beautiful village house is now used about eight times a year. We have a shortage of housing in Vermont. That's one of the things that's different. The cost basis is so different today than it was in the time that Act 250 was invented. So we do have a real shortage that we have to address. And so those are some of the differences between today and 50 years ago in terms of the environment that we're trying to navigate. I think um, communities also are doing more planning work because we've provided, whether it was Act 200 or designation programs, more resources for planning and more capability. So um, I hope this is an issue and a year that we're, where we can find common ground and we can figure out the right balance where we are um, using a, plan, a thoughtful planning process, supporting communities, but also asking everybody to make room to be more equitable and more welcoming as a state. So I'm gonna stop there and I hope I'm under 10 minutes. Uh, 1149. <laughs> yeah, the, I do have just a quick uh, clarification. You referred to a, a corrective action plans. Can you just say a little more about what those are? Um, when you have a site that has environmental problems, it uh, you then need a corrective action plan. And it takes a really long time, and Kathy can probably speak to this way better than I, but I am hearing regularly from developers who don't want to build on polluted sites where there's any danger, how long that process takes. And I don't know if they're, I'm not an environmental expert either. I'm not a scientist here, but I'm just saying that it takes more than a year to work through that process too often. And so I think that's something that we really need to look at with our friends at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Thank you very much. Um, with that, next up is uh, Seth Jensen, Principal Planner of Lamoille County Planning Commission. And Mr. Jensen, are you on the... I'm, I'm behind oh, there you. There you are. Thank <laughs> you. I'm sorry. Looking at the screen. <clears throat> Good morning. Thanks for coming in. It's not perfect. It's true. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. 
Um, I'm Seth Jensen. I'm the deputy director of the Lamoille County Planning Commission. Um, LCPC's executive director, um, Tasha Wallace, spoke to the Committee on Natural Resources last week about S213, um, a bill that's focused on protection of uh, wetlands, floodplains, um, and um, dam removal. Um, I'm also joined uh, today by Melissa Manka, who's a new planner at LCPC, um, who has been working um, since joining us in November on um, housing issues through the Housing Navigator Program, as well as the Municipal Technical Assistance Program, two of the very important initiatives that the legislature passed last session. Um, so I would like to take a moment to speak about some of the housing issues that uh, we face in Lamoille County. Um, and it is impossible to discuss housing in Lamoille County, planning in Lamoille County, um, and land use in Lamoille County um, without discussing um, uh, last summer and winter's flooding. Um, and I would just like to be sure that we um, are all clear on the severity and urgency that we currently face in our region and the state as a whole. Um, two of the four largest floods recorded in Lamoille County occurred in the last six months. That's the July uh, flood and then the December uh, flood. Um, and those floods highlighted gaps in inadequacies of many of our existing programs and systems and is often the case, those gaps have the greatest impact on the people with the fewest resources. Um, those gaps exist in um, many areas. Um, those gaps also exist in uh, the planning process and the permitting process. Um, and what we are watching unfold um, in our time is the climate crisis and the housing crisis converging into an equity crisis. So nearly six months after the July floodwaters receded, many people and communities are still living daily with the impacts of the floods. Um, we met just last week um, with the folks who are organizing the Memorial Area Recovery Network. Um, and there are still people who have been displaced from their homes, are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, people even in this weather, um, who are living in homes that are damaged without heat or electricity, um, and people who are living in unsafe conditions and unable to relocate because of the lack of safe and affordable housing options outside of the floodplain. So I could walk through the impacts in each of the communities in our region um, in recognition of the time limits and respect to other witnesses. I will uh, save that for my written testimony, but I will forward that on to all of you. Um, I'll summarize those issues by noting that two major issues were highlighted uh, by <clears throat> the flooding, more than two, but two that are pertinent to the discussion today. And that is that many of the areas that were most impacted by the flood are also um, home to low and moderate income households. The location of our oldest, but also most affordable housing stock um, and the location where there are high concentrations of rental housing. A few days after the July flood, I spoke to a member of a local select board who had himself lead his home in the middle of the night on July 10th as the waters were cresting in the Lamoille. Um, and he remarked to me that we were, if there was any silver lining, it was that the flood occurred in July and not December. Mm -hmm. um, on True. December 14th, that comment developed a sense of cruel irony. Yeah. Um, as the Lamoille River flooded once again, and in his community, we were less than three inches away from the river once again cresting into many of the neighborhoods that had been evacuated only six months before. Um, you saw the post office in Johnson flood that was not near as severe. Um, and though the physical impacts were not as severe as July, um, it had left a great impact of lasting trauma um, on people who, were, who had experienced the flood in July. Um, and many, what we heard from our partners in the human service world is that 
um, people who had been trying to make do um, since July came out of the woodwork seeking help. Um, so I'm gonna read um, a letter that's now 10 years old that was sent to me from the residents of the Mans Meadow Senior Housing uh, Complex in Jeffersonville, um, which had flooded in 2011, uh, which was the focus of a lot of flood mitigation planning efforts to reduce um, damages, because I think it is as policymakers, whether the local or regional um, or state level, important to remember that housing isn't just about a structure, it's about security, and it's about um, people living in those. Um, in, in 2011, this um, building was evacuated, and these are their words, um, not mine. Um, and I just want to, um, as someone with the access and privilege to speak to you, make sure that their voices are heard as well. Um, for us, memories of the forced evacuations from our homes remain frightful ones. With the increased frequency and severity of the storms that led to major flooding events, these anxieties are compounded. It is stressful to our families and loved ones as well, who had been under the impression that we were living in secure circumstances. And I want to pause and return to the policy discussion on that last statement, who had been under the impression that we were living in secure circumstances, that one of the things we have learned that we knew, um, but perhaps need to learn again, um, is how old and inadequate the FEMA maps are for predicting actual flood levels. Um, from a policy standpoint, while we've widely acknowledged that those FEMA maps or old and outdated, um, we also need to acknowledge that our process for identifying where new development can and should happen is also old and outdated and inadequate to deal with the um, challenges that we are facing today. Um, the designation program, which has been a wonderful program for revitalizing the cores of our villages and downtowns, was focused on the cores of the villages and downtowns, not the surrounding residential areas. Um, there is no clear provision in existing statute for identifying new areas um, that are disassociated with existing villages and downtowns that are located in safer areas out of floodplain areas. Um, there is some language about that in the designation study, as well as the uh, Regional Planning Commission's um, land use study. Um, and those are gaps that are as equally important to address as the outdated uh, flood maps. Um, we need to both be identifying where it's unsafe to build as well as where we um, can be building. Um, I was a young planner after Irene. I have my recovery uh, sticker from working on Irene recovery. Um, and I remember the celebration every time um, we reopened a road, every time a new community was open. And I want to close, um, I think, with the thought that for the recovery of the July 2023 and December 2023, um, floods to be truly successful, we need to have the same celebration um, for building flooding, uh, building homes outside of the floodplain that the average Vermonter can afford. Um, and that that will be the true mark of recovery uh, from um, these events that will be the true mark of moving forward. Um, we need to figure out where that housing is going to be built. Be built built, we need to enable it, and then we need to build it. Um, and we need to start in 1995. We can't start in 1995, so we need to start in 2020. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Scott, you're still a young planner. <laughs> <laughs> I will say younger planner then. <laughs> um, the quick thing, so one S213 yes. is focused exactly on the mapping and river corridor and plane Thank you. addressing that. Uh, from an environmental and a housing point of view, development point of view. And I mean, that's the other thing is thanks for um, reminding us or reminding me and others of the trauma that lives. You know, we're having a very tidy meeting in a tidy building, talking pieces of paper, figuring out plans. It's all important and necessary, but underneath it, there are a lot of people who are really suffering still. And thank you for bringing their 
remind any staff that are bringing their voice to the meeting. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for recognizing them as well. I think Seth said something when he testified to us about being up at night and considering it a personal failure if we don't see the housing built. And it, I know it's because you carry those stories with you of everyone you have to tell that you don't have another option for them. So we really, and we'll be doing this in your honor as well. Thank you. So you've been part of the change. Thank you. Thank you for everything you are doing. Um, with that, then next up is uh, Kathy Byer, Senior VP of Real Estate Development for Evernorth. And Ms. Byer, I, you're on the screen. I'm here. She's here. I just saw her. I keep getting thrown to a curveball. I look mm -hmm. up and I see someone's name on the screen, so I think they're going to. She may be sharing her screen. I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that are we able to do that this morning? I that one always open believe so. <laughs> Give it a try. It always makes me nervous. I'm going to get it wrong. So um, see a ball game. Ball see what happens. <laughs> uh, Did it work? There you go. Amazing. Um, good morning. It's um, been some great testimony this morning. And um, as you know, I am uh, testifying as a nonprofit housing developer from Evernorth, but also as a member of the NRB steering committee. Um, and one of the clear legislative charges you gave the steering committee was to come up with a place-based jurisdiction framework for Act 250. And you've heard a lot about that this morning, the great comments from um, Charlie and Catherine and others. Um, I'd like to stray a bit from the NRB report and provide some context um, specifically as it relates to affordable housing. So the downtown designation program started in 1999. And over the years, um, legislature added other designations programs such as the village center, growth centers, new town centers, and neighborhood development areas. And I think it was about 10 years ago that the concept of priority housing projects was introduced. And as you know, those are mixed income developments with 20% of the units dedicated to affordable. And if you are a, I'm gonna start saying PHP because it's a lot easier to say than priority housing projects. PHPs are exempt from Act 250 if you're in a designated downtown, a new town center, a growth center, or a neighborhood um, development area. And it used to be, there used to be a cap on the number of units. You lifted that cap last year um, until 2026. And I will say that the PHP exemption has been utilized frequently, frequently by both nonprofit and private developers. And in the majority of Evernorth's projects with our local workers around the state have benefited from the PHP exemption. So in my mind, the PHP exemption has laid the groundwork for what is included in the NRB steering committee recommendation. And I will say, I think it is monumental that there was consensus that there should be Act 250 exemption in what is called the um, tier one designation areas. I think the definition of tier one areas is likely um, among the most challenging efforts you will have before you as you consider this. But I wanted to talk about some uh, existing um, framework that's in place, um, which is the neighborhood development areas. And I think you will find a very good foundation for um, how you might frame a tier one area. The um, NDA, Neighbor Development app, uh, Area, is a very robust application process. Um, I'm such a nerd, I have the application right here. Um, and uh, the application process includes assessment of flood hazard areas, mapping of important natural resources, public infrastructure, and density requirements. Um, so. Here's a, I, I literally, I, I can send you the whole application if you want, but you have to identify many of the things that are of concern in the 10 criteria for Act 250 in the NDA. And in my mind, um, that is what we are talking about when we um, talk about exempting development in tier one areas. You might ask, 
why is this important for the purposes of building more housing? And um, Gus touched upon it. And I will tell you that as a real estate developer that I think the Act 250 permitting process is administered in a very professional manner. Um, but you, um, we, we would get our Act 250 permit sooner, but all the underlying state permits have to be in hand. State water, wastewater, storm water, uh, water supply, which is a very lengthy process to get through. Um, so that means the Act 250 permit can't drop and the 30 day appeal period clock can't start. And for a real estate developer, this is the time when you are the most at risk. You have not vested in your permit and really the value that you are pursuing by spending money on architects and engineers is at risk until you have that permit appeal free. And it's not uncommon, I'm shocked sometimes when we get to the, um, uh, for our projects that need Act 250 permits and I look at how much we've spent in pre-development, it can be up to $500,000 that has been at risk until we get past that um, appeal free period. So in my mind, the true cost of when we say permit redundancy is this, um, is this risk that the developer has to take to get to that appeal free um, moment. And if we can construct a tier one designation that provides, um, that provides a framework that is in, in, in keeping with the framework of Act 250, I do think we are gonna be able to build more housing and we're gonna be able to build it a bit faster. I wanna point out that the NRB steering committee um, in the report made it clear that uh, the recommendations need to start as, as a whole, the consensus only held together uh, as a whole, which meant that also the, there needed to be the tier two and tier three designation areas. But I wanna shift, uh, shift to another topic um, that is governance and appeals. The steering committee was, did have consensus on creating a more professionalized NRB um, natural resources board with a full-time chair and three to five um, part-time members who had experience in land use. But there was not consensus on whether the appeals should continue to be heard in the environmental court or go to the um, professionalized NRB. I will say, regardless of what you decide, a strong message needs to be that housing projects, appeals of housing projects need to be decided within six months. And currently it takes 12 to 24 months. And when I'm talking about appeals, I'm also talking about appeal of the local permit. Um, I think you are hearing from or heard from Ben Frost from New Hampshire about yeah. the New Hampshire Housing Board of Appeals, which does require resolution within six months. In my understanding, they are actually uh, averaging four months. I think most of you have heard about our Putney project on Holloway Drive. We are now almost in year two of fighting, fighting a permit battle. First, our uh, uh, the appeal of our local permit, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. And now we've been appealed on a jurisdictional opinion. A jurisdictional opinion is just you go to the district coordinator, you present the evidence that you meet the priority housing project exemption, and the district coordination coordinator signs says, yes, agree. And as a developer, you have to have that to bring for, forward to your financing because you need an attorney to sign a permit opinion. An attorney won't sign a permit opinion without that JO in hand. We were appealed by the same neighbor on the JO. Elevation of 25 homes we're trying to build on Holloway Drive. It's right across from the Putney Food Co-op. It is in a neighborhood development area. If we had a reasonable approach to resolving appeals in Vermont, we would be moving 25 households into their homes now. And I wanna stress, these aren't units, they're homes. And these are the voices we don't hear. The voices of renters who wanna live on Hallway Drive in Putney. They're not even given a seat at the table. We don't hear from them. Maybe they don't live in Putney now, but they'd like to live there. Maybe they're unhoused. I don't know, I can't meet them until we open the doors to their 25 new homes. Thank you. 
Um, for another clarification. So the, your through permitting and then your JO was appealed. Can you just explain briefly? Uh, so the JO, my understanding is it's what indicates that you need to be in Act 250 or, or, or you were exempted from. And so what was the issue that got appealed? The um, jurisdictional opinion that the district coordinator issues is what confirms that you are a PHP and therefore exempt from Act 250. And um, anyone who has party status in Act 250 can and the the appeal, frankly, had uh, very little explanation of why. The um, specifications for a, a prior housing project, at least as I've seen them so far, seem relatively cut and dry. I'm not. Can you just say very briefly what it is that's appealable about whether or not a development is actually correctly characterized as a PHP? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> if you have an expert here that might be better off. I can speak that. to the Putney project. Savannah Haskell with the NRB. There is a road that goes through the, the property. There's two parcels, but they're the same span number, by the way. So same owner. But there's a road that goes through there. So my understanding is, is they feel like it doesn't qualify because there's, they've been split. And uh, RJO found that it was indeed a PHP, yeah. but there, that's a nuance that is being challenged. Okay. Um, well, I, I, have, I have a good sense parking, of when- It's a road to parking for the units. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I know enough not to ask anything more. Um, because <laughs> it will lead to an appropriate, but much longer conversation. So thanks for helping fill us in. Um, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, and with that, we'll go move to um, Joanna Lawton from Rebuild by Design. Uh, Ms. Lawton, good morning. Thank you for joining our joint committee. Thank you and good morning. I am going to try to share my screen if that's possible. Should be getting that permission momentarily. And if we're sharing it in Mahali, is it in Magali, is there a way to get it bigger? Because Kathy's was great, but none of us could possibly read it. So there was only, I'm hoping Kathy's sending it to you because that's the only way we'll ever read it. Okay. Except maybe um, young eyes. So. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Let's see if we can make it as big as possible. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. My name is Johanna Law, and I'm a project manager at Rebuild by Design. We are a nonprofit organization that works with communities and governments to plan for climate change. And planning for climate change is very much embedded in our DNA, as our origin story is rooted in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy hitting the Northeast. It revealed to our region that not only were we uh, much more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change on a physical level, but also that our social vulnerabilities were inextricably linked to the physical vulnerabilities. And so solving for one had to address solving for the other. In response to this massive challenge, the federal government under the Department of Housing and Urban Development and President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force realized that a traditional design approach to rebuilding a region and putting back exactly what was there before would not address the scale of the challenge. As a result, they launched the Rebuild by Design Hurricane Sandy Design Competition, which was an interdisciplinary year-long design competition that changed the traditional approach to, desi to design after a disaster. Uh, by creating an iterative process of research and design that truly raised the bar for community collaboration and centering communities at the heart of all of the outcomes. At the end of this competition, uh, seven projects were awarded for a total of $930 million. And those seven winning designs that are in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut now have over $4.3 billion of of uh, over $4.3 billion invested in them 
which really demonstrates that when you have innovative climate adaptation infrastructure projects, they will attract a lot more dollars. And so since then, we have been bringing our approach, our research, our designs to communities around the world. And more recently, we have been focusing our attention a little bit closer to home. Uh, we've been looking closer at the U.S. and even at communities that historically have been sort of tagged as climate havens. We know that the realities on the ground are not, not exactly what we're hearing in the, in the news so this past summer, just shortly after the July flooding, uh, we put out a report that looked at the recent flooding as well as the litany of, of events that this event had built upon. Um, our report called the Vermont Atlas of Disaster found that Vermont had experienced 17 federally declared major disasters just between 2011 and 2021. And 15 of those events were due to tropical storms and flooding. This placed Vermont seventh overall in the entire nation for highest number of disaster declarations in that time period and ranked it fifth in the country for per capita post-disaster federal assistance allocations. We also found in our report that every county had had four or more recent major disasters and six counties had had at least 10 with Washington County having had the highest number of disaster declarations in the state with over 11 disasters. And I do just wanna note because this cuts off at 2021, um, some of the more recent droughts, severe storms and flooding were not even captured in this data that we know is a growing data set of recent events. So just to give you a really quick overview of what is in the report that I think can be useful to you as decision makers, um, but will also be accessible through the written testimony. Um, this report includes maps that show the occurrences of disaster declarations for every single county in Vermont for a total, as I mentioned, of 17. And it has that right next to the post-disaster allocations of federal funding through FEMA, which is mapped in the orange map. And we've added that to HUD CDBG DR funds to give sort of a, a glimpse into the, um, the amount of federal post-disaster funding that's going into recovering from these uh, events. But I always like to caveat that we know this is just a piece of the pie of the true cost of these events, as there's also insurance payouts, there's uh, loan programs, there's the personal cost that people and residents are taking on. But it does start to give us a sense of the magnitude and the scale of this challenge ahead. We've included all of the data in our report, so you can go in and if you look at the tables in the report, you can see actually county by county the number of disaster declarations that that county has experienced in this time frame, as well as the total FEMA obligations for public assistance dollars and hazard mitigation dollars. And so you can go to a county and look at the disasters it has experienced and the federal funding it has received. You can also go to a disaster event and then look at the specific counties going down that were impacted by it. This report also includes a map of the social vulnerability throughout the state using CDC data, as well as energy reliability by utility territory. So the areas that are a little bit darker orange in that map are areas that on average take longer to come back online during an energy outage event. And finally, the last set of maps um, that we've recently added to this report is the disaster declaration map with an overlay of legislative districts. So you can look at the specific legislative districts and see which counties they, they uh, represent and the total number of disasters that that district also has experienced. And so I do want to note that this report for Vermont um, builds out of a nationwide report that we've put out last year um, that includes a number of different uh, chapters that are useful to decision makers, but two that I really want to highlight are the guide for states to build a collaborative program and new finance tools for addressing this challenge. And the reason that we thought it was you know, so incredibly important when we began digging into this data to put out this step forward and sort of the, the one, two step guide of how to solve for this challenge is we found when we looked at the entire US that 90% of counties in the US have had a federal disaster declaration due to extreme weather just between 2011 and 2021. 
And all of this data for us immediately, aside from making our jaws drop on the floor, show that the reality is that climate change is no longer just coming. Climate change is here. And for Vermont specifically, this means that Vermont needs a sustainable source of long-term climate adaptation infrastructure funding. We've proposed in our report one way in which Vermont could support this challenge or address this challenge is through a 2% surcharge on property and casualty insurance, which could raise $600 million. We like this mechanism for supporting resilient infrastructure because it's progressive. Um, you can surcharge property wealth protection. And so intrinsically those with more homes and cars, boats, et cetera, um, are likely to have um, more insurance. It also would go directly back to making those insured assets more resilient um, and could decrease certain insurance premiums for all consumers. So if you look at specific models such as FEMA's community rating program, um, which rewards consumers um, who all invest in uh, lowering their flood risk, they actually decrease the premiums by five to 45%. So already there's a benefit built into building resilient infrastructure. Um, the investment can also seed a new industry and support thousands of jobs. We also believe that you can take it a step further to institutionalize equity into the program um, by ensuring that the surcharge is instituted on certain types of insurance that largely are connected to climate impacts. So for example, we suggest um, exempting workers' compensation, medical malpractice lines from property and casualty insurance so that you are looking at specifically lines of insurance that cover types of property that are also contributing to the climate crisis. Um, you could also take another step further and exempt certain um, residents such as lowest income policyholders and affordable housing residents. We know that currently there are bills being considered um, that look into an insurance surcharge mechanism, and we do have just two recommendations that we think could make this sort of policy become a lot stronger. One would be to ensure that you use a percentage instead of a set amount of a surcharge so that it is a sustainable source of funding that could grow over time as the need grows. Also, we think that there are certain ways that you can define the types of projects that the fund would support upfront to ensure you are addressing the exact needs of Vermonters. So just to point out one specific example, in New York State, we built the research and advocacy to support a resilient infrastructure fund that was voted through an environmental bond act. And we made sure that $250 million was allocated specifically for manage retreat so that those homeowners who live in areas that we will not be able to adapt had options and would end up having a program they can turn to to relocate out of harm's way. We also know that some uh, advocates are advocating for a polluters pay mechanism, which could raise up to $2.5 billion in the state um, and also has a direct tie to those, a direct policy tie to those who <laughs> have made the mess in the state. And finally, I do just want to conclude that, you know, we are rather agnostic to the particular source of funding that Vermont utilizes, though I will say that we have seen time and again, every community, city, state that has started to invest in their resilient infrastructure has been overwhelmingly supported by voters. Um, in New York State in particular, we saw in our recent election where we advocated for an environmental bond act that the bond act actually surpassed uh, or flew flew by with, uh, uh, what's the expression I'm blanking on it, flying colors um, with a greater support than even our governor had at the time. And so I'll just end there that if you have any questions, happy to follow up after. Um, and we really hope that we can work with you to support a resilient infrastructure fund for Vermont so that we can protect the lives, the property, and the communities all across the state. Great, thank you very much. And I'm guessing we have your um, PowerPoint. Yes, you should have the PowerPoint and we'll have an additional written out testimony as well. Great, and one very quick question is our who are your partners in Vermont? Are you working, for instance, with anyone in state government or legislators? How are you connecting to us? 
Hopefully. Yeah, we've been building out a, a pretty deep network at this moment in Vermont when we were building out the report. Um, and I'm, I apologize if I confuse the alphabet soup of acronyms of nonprofit organizations. We were working with a coalition, um, Vermont Businesses and Sustainability, VBSR, um, Vermont Energy Action Network. We were working with Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, and I may be blanking on a few. So we've been working with a coalition of primarily nonprofit organizations who have been working in the environmental sector, and then more recently building out some, some ties throughout um, uh, policy leaders in the state. Okay. And we're always open to finding more partnerships. That is really our, our goal is to be a resource to you all. Sure. Um, any particular contact with the Agency of Natural Resources? Um, I'll have to double check with my colleague and I can get back to you. Thank you so much. If we wanted to get a copy of the report, I, I have it. We printed them out. Magali has printed out. We can print out. Oh, love one. So, sounds like all, I think all our presentations are going to end up on both committees' web pages probably today. Great. Okay. Yeah, it's on ours already. Cool. Uh, we were really glad to invite Rebuild by Design because. I think we saw some raised eyebrows from your committee, and it really gave us a lot to think about uh, in a very short amount of time, and we recommend people have them back in to testify. One of the interesting things about your tax proposals, you have six of the seven members of Senate Finance around this table, including the chair, and I think Chair Cummings was taking on board this recommendation and had some questions as a follow-up or no, concerns. I Finance also regulates insurance. Has any state adopted the surcharge on insurance policies? No, we, uh, we've gotten really close in New York State. Um, and then ultimately, our governor at the time decided to go with a bond act because it was a little bit um, more politically feasible at the time. Though we do think yeah. that um, there's still an opportunity in New York state. And then there are a couple of other states that are considering at the time, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and a little bit of Maine as well. Well, thank you again for your presentation. And uh, with that, we'll uh, go on to um, Rob Wilmington, attorney from North Bennington. Good morning, Mr. Wilmington. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I know you had a, uh, you're jumping from one meeting to another. So thanks for giving us in. I am, thank you. So my name is Rob Wilmington. Uh, I live in North Bennington. I've practiced municipal land use and environmental law in Vermont for 40 years. I recently retired. Um, I've been involved in probably 20 administrative and court proceedings involving I-215, including a number of appeals to the Supreme Court. I've uh, represented towns, regional planning commissions, interveners, and project proponents. Uh, I try appeals before the old environmental board as well as the environmental court. Uh, my most recent case in the Supreme Court resulted in the reversal of an egregiously bad decision by the environmental court relating to the siting of a commercial development at an interstate exit. And I've litigated dozens of zoning cases before local boards in court and before the Supreme Court. Uh, in connection with housing, I've served for seven years. I served for seven years as the first chair of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Uh, as a municipal lawyer, I've been involved in the planning and financing of a range of housing projects in Bennington County. And I'm also a member of a small community development company in North Bennington that's been trying to redevelop a large house into multifamily housing in the center of our village. And even with the uh, so-called missing middle state funding, the project has proved to be too expensive to go forward. Uh, there are no obvious regulatory issues there, it's just the construction costs and the soft costs are too high. So from that perspective, I'd like to briefly make three points. Uh, first, in my experience, Act 250 has not been a significant barrier to the type of housing projects that have been proposed and built in Bennington County. Local zoning and permitting processes more often create uncertainty than Act 250. Uh, and the issues that arise in Act 250 proceedings are often different from those considered in local zoning proceedings. Uh, I'm sure there are examples of duplicated review of the same issues in zoning and active 50 cases, but in 40 years practicing in this field, I saw very little of that. Uh, second, uh, the appeals process in the environmental court has not worked well. The old environmental board, in my experience, did a much better job in processing appeals in the court. 
the board's decisions provided much more guidance for the party. And frankly, the process was more streamlined. Uh, I would strongly recommend that the environmental court be stripped of jurisdiction over Act 250's appeals. I think all the stakeholders, including developers, would be better served. Uh, I also want to emphasize that I've seen many cases in which project opponents had valid, even compelling reasons to oppose development projects. And that's particularly with commercial and industrial ones. There needs to be an appropriate venue for those issues to be resolved. But the, the jurisdiction in the environmental court has been a flop. It's time to restore a competent administrative body to do this important work, uh, perhaps with panels or with the aid of hearing officers as with the Public Utility Commission. And, and third and finally, uh, I think expediting permit review in designated areas is the right approach to getting new housing built with appropriate regulatory review. Uh, developers need more certainty and predictable costs. Communities need assurance that they will not be unduly burdened by environmental impacts or infrastructure costs associated with new projects. And the most important step to accomplish this is to designate particular development areas that meet prescribed standards. Uh, I'm not prepared to comment on the specific recommendations of the recently completed NRB study, but I've looked at the report and I believe the approach of three tiered locational jurisdictions suggested there. It, it seems spot on to me and the right way to proceed. So thank you for inviting me to testify. I'd be happy to address any questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Looking at our, our, our there, that you're, you're so succinct that <laughs> we could take a question or two. Any, any members of the committees want to ask a question of our woman? Senator Harrison, uh, just to, and, and this question doesn't need to be answered now, but um, commercial and industrial has come up a couple of times in this meeting. And I think it would be helpful to know at some point in this process, of course, we're talking about housing, that's our main focus, but we don't want to inadvertently impact commercial and development or, or commercial and industrial in ways that we don't intend. And there might be opportunities to make that process better. So I, I'm just saying that right. um, I appreciate you bringing that up, um, the, the commercial and industrial. And if you want to provide written comments, that would be wonderful. And I do think the NRB study took into account commercial and industrial activity. Well, yeah, just to your point. Yeah, so I'm discussing, right, two the, one now says would be okay. Right, mm -hmm. right, but I have some questions about that too. Mm -hmm. Sure, but sure, we can yeah. talk about that in our. Uh, Senator Brock, that's a question. Uh, in your opinion, you you mentioned that the environmental court model does not seem to work well. Why would a housing board or some other enterprise, such as uh, the use of a hear the hearing officer model, work better than the court model? Well, I'll give you two responses to that. One is I, I've experienced both of them in Vermont, and my experience was that the old environmental board um, did a better job. Uh, it got it got decisions that were uh, it, it had proceedings that were workable, that were consistent, and it just it, I practiced ten or fifteen years before that, and, and as well as the environmental court, and I, I just found it was better for everybody, frankly. Uh, second of all, you know when it, when the old environmental board and the NRB have to do policy and regulatory work, uh, they have a really deep, you have a deeper knowledge of what the, what the whole set of issues is, I think, than the court brought to it. And it informed the boards, uh, when it informed the old environmental board, when it was trying to do regulatory uh, policy making, it had a really good grip on what the real practical issues were. Uh, and um, I, other lawyers may may remind me here, but I don't recall many uh, environmental court decisions that really sort of gave broad frameworks that were helpful to future litigants. And the environmental board was able to formulate approaches um, in a pretty coherent way. So I'm speaking from experience. I think the Public Utilities Commission, which also does regulatory policy making as well as adjudicatory stuff, ha has has worked pretty well. And some version of that, I just think, is better than. Um, than, than the court. So I, I'm not sure that fully addresses your question, but it's a practical, uh, my practical experience, and also I think the role of combining them makes for better policy and also better adjudication. Okay. 
Well, great. Um, thanks so much, Mr. Wilmington, for joining us and providing testimony. And um, we have been churning along. Uh, I had a good clip this morning. Uh, I'd like to take a proposal. We'll take a, a 10 minute break. So we will reconvene at 1040. Okay. We're following today's hearing. Uh, Senator Clarkson, can you join us at the table? I am Thank at you. the table. I'm just seeing you now. You know. <laughs> it's Wednesday, January 24th, 2024, and resuming the uh, the second half of our morning uh, meeting, a joint meeting with Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, and Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We're talking about housing and regulatory reform, and we're picking back up again. Uh, our next uh, guest is uh, Megan Tuttle, Director of the Office of City Planning, City of Burlington. Uh, good morning, Ms. Tuttle. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, Chairs and all of the committee members. Thank you for the invitation to join you this morning. Um, I just want to note that I appreciate that I'm in the middle of this group here this morning. So I ha I've really enjoyed the opportunity to hear from so many statewide experts in their fields that have already spoken to you today. Um, as Chair Bray said, my name is Megan Tuttle, and I am the Planning Director for the City of Burlington. I am also one of the working group members that prepared the report on municipal, de uh, municipal delegation that was directed by Act 47 last session. As Planning Director, I lead a team that's responsible for long-range planning and the creation and maintenance of the city's zoning bylaws. I also work closely with the staff that administers our local permitting process. In the near decade that I've worked with the city, our council has adopted dozens of changes to our bylaws to better define and implement our planning goals and be responsive to the changing dynamics in the city. Many of these changes have been about removing barriers to housing creation, from streamlining the permitting process within downtown, to making it easier to build an ADU, to implementing new rules to manage short-term rentals. Today, we are working on other major housing-focused changes, including to enable the sort of neighborhood scale housing solutions that were the subject of the municipal zoning provisions of Act 47. We also have a long history of participating in the state's designation programs. Just this fall, we received approval to expand our neighborhood development area designation to incorporate an area of the city that was recently zoned to support a new neighborhood's creation. As Kathy Byer noted, um, I, I mentioned these designations because they're significant in their demonstration that a municipality has gone a long way to plan for and regulate many of the issues that Act 250 is designed to review. Despite this work and many community and state efforts, our state is still experiencing a number of significant and in many ways unprecedented housing challenges, uh, many challenges to provide the housing that is needed for Vermonters. Not all of these challenges are within state or local control but they are important factors that are influencing and bring increased attention to the processes and laws that we do control. Uh, I agree with what Charlie Baker said earlier that these laws can and do influence developer behavior. And as a planner, I welcomed the steps that were taken to advance municipal bylaws through Act 47. Just last evening in a meeting with our planning commission, we were discussing the city's inclusionary zoning ordinance a policy that we've had since the 1990s, which was novel at the time that it was adopted, which mandates that permanently affordable housing be created in new developments. This is an important and foundational housing tool that we need, particularly in this moment. And yet we're confronted daily with the realities of our state's housing challenges. The HFA's 2023 annual report noted the steep increase 76% increase, in fact, in the cost for constructing new multifamily housing development since 2018. This means that for projects to deliver affordable housing in this environment, particularly if they're providing affordable home ownership opportunities, the gap between the cost to build and the allowable cost to sell that unit can be well over $100,000 per unit. Here in Burlington, we're searching for ways to find a balance between this reality while we maintain our commitment to ensuring new development provides permanently affordable housing. While this example is not about Act 250, I share it for a few reasons. First is that while not any one of these issues, um, Act 250 or municipal regulation alone are the reasons why housing can be difficult to advance in Vermont, we must consider that the cumulative impacts of these laws together can frustrate it. 
And second, I share it as a local <coughs> example of what the chair said in his opening remarks. Through careful evaluation and evolution of our policies here in the city, housing creation and permanently affordable housing do not need to be in conflict with one another. As a professional planner, I completely agree that housing creation and the environment do not need to be in conflict with one another. However, what this example highlights is that we need to closely consider the purpose and outcomes of our laws and policies, and in this particular moment, ensure that any additional cost of regulation and complications of permitting are carefully weighed alongside the positive intended outcomes of those laws. As a member of the Vermont Planners Association, I've been engaged in conversations with planners around the state about Act 250 going back to the legislature's own commission in 2018. I understand and appreciate that changing this law requires careful consideration to preserve what has been strong and positive while also recognizing that we have an opportunity to strengthen it to better achieve our, state, our shared goals. I echo others' support for the interrelated land use, Act 250 updates, and designation studies that are before you. I'm really encouraged by the coordination and synergy in the recommendations coming from these studies, particularly in their focus on how Act 250 jurisdiction can be relaxed in areas where careful planning and the evolution of both state and local regulations support growth in ways that reflect statewide development goals. Members of the Municipal Delegation Working Group were engaged in these studies and continuously circled back to understand the related implications on our work. We think these studies go a long way and we continue to recommend municipal delegation as an additional tool that could build on those changes. Um, similar to what Catherine Dimitrik said, uh, municipal delegation is not about weakening Act 250. The report recommends an Act 250 exemption for development within communities that have confirmed through a collaboration with their regional planning commission and the NRB that the municipal bylaws and permitting and enforcement processes are functionally equivalent to the criteria that Act 250 would have otherwise reviewed. As members of the working group, we did a deep dive into our municipal ordinances to evaluate where there are overlaps between these laws and the criteria in Act 250. We found a high level of overlap, certainly some areas where our municipal planning can be strengthened. But here in Burlington, in the time since Act 250 was enacted and our, our bylaws have become much more comprehensive and robust, and we estimate that we currently regulate approximately 90 to 95% of what Act 250 also reviews. The delegation study recommends a process through which municipalities can demonstrate their comprehensive nature of their, their laws, a process through which the NRB can consider applications after a public hearing, and establishes an agreement with municipalities and the Act 250 to administer local permits in lieu of Act 250. It does not fundamentally change Act 250 on its own, and we think it can be an important complement to the other reforms that you're already considering. Notably, it, builds, it also builds on other forms of municipal delegation presently enabled in statute, such as for the State Shoreland Protection Act and for building code and fire safety standards both of which Burlington administers in lieu of state permits today. We believe that this is an important complement that can allow municipalities with the regulatory and staffing resources to support statewide housing goals, um, particularly as you consider the recommendations of these other studies and, and really as you define the areas of the state that would fall within these certain planning areas or tiers. In particular, one potential gap I see from Burlington's perspective, where municipal delegation can be important, relates to how small housing types, the sort of duplex and four unit buildings that were the focus of Act 47, would actually get implemented. Areas like Burlington's New North End, which represents half of the city's land area, a quarter of the population, and is served by infrastructure, where many of these new home types could be accommodated, do not currently qualify for exemption from Act 250 under the state's designation programs and seem unlikely to be exempted under the new frameworks contemplated in these studies. The city does have a local review process called Major Impact that's substantially similar to Act 250. Uh, and in the new North End, this would require a very detailed level of review for projects as few as five units. Projects of this small scale are much more susceptible to the escalating costs of housing development and duplicative development review processes. And ultimately, I think municipal delegation could be an important tool to lean on that robust, robust level of local review and ensure that high quality development is happening at multiple scales in the city. 
So I uh, just want to be here to, again, echo my support for the efforts and appreciate this committee's collaboration and focus on these issues this morning. And i um, happy to be available to answer any questions about any of this uh, later. Thank you very much, Ms. Um we're, we're holding questions and conversation for the most part till we're done to see if we have any time actually left over. Um, and with that, we uh, thank you. And we're going to move on to uh, Kim Taylor, former chair of District 3 Environmental Commission. Um, Mr. Taylor, good morning. And thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I have to say I'm somewhat humbled uh, to be speaking to you in uh, the company of this uh, illustrious group. Um, I, um, for those of you who might not know me, I'm, I'm a retired vegetable farmer. Um, I wish I could get this down a little bit here. Here we go. Um, having farmed for 43 years with my wife, Janet, in the village of Post Mills in the town of Thedford, Vermont. And our farm, thanks to Act 250, actually has grown to, and I'll explain that in a moment, to 56 acres of mixed vegetables, berries, and 20 greenhouses. And we grow approximately 30,000 pounds of tomatoes annually. Uh, for f 11 years, I was chair of the District 3 Environmental Commission, um, and the towns included our uh, population ranges from Hartford of about, you know, 10,000, 668, depending upon your numbers, and as small as Granville with 301. The district includes towns in Orange County, Windsor County mostly, and, and two actually in Addison County. We go right up to the top of the snowball. And our towns are reflective of what is pretty much statewide, where in the state, a total of the state is has 125 one-acre towns, which means they're, those towns do not have subdivision and statutorily approved subdivision zoning, which is about 45% of the towns, and then 137 presently are 10-acre towns. Additionally, I've served on the Town of Thedford Development Review Board for the past 20 years and I'm presently its chair. Uh, and we've had zoning and subdivision bylaws since 1972. And finally, for what it's worth, uh, I graduated from Vermont Law School in 1978 and clerked for Jonathan Brownell, one of the authors of Act 250. Senator Bray asked us to explain our experiences with Act 250 openly and honestly. And I was gonna share a couple of anecdotes with you. First, as a young farmer in the early 1980s, uh, we had a small fledgling farm, I abandoned <laughs> the, the world of, of, of farming, of um, law practice rather quickly. And- uh, um, voice was And- uh, there was two neighbors who were going to build next to us over the course of the next 10 years. One of them wanted 10 two-acre lots, and Act 250, which was chaired by Allison Flannery at the time, uh, heard testimony, testimony, and they denied that Act 250 uh, uh, d application. And the long and the short of it was the 10 units were denied because of lack of clustering, no showing of unable to build on its remaining 70 acres and potential impact on the farm. The developer turned to us and sold us the land and we continued to farm. Then later on, there was a proposal for 56 units. This is rather ironic when we are speaking about housing here today, I'm sure you can see that, um, were proposed on some very prime agricultural soils. And uh, the long and the short of that was 24 units were finally settled on, 15 acres of prime agricultural soils were conserved. And in the upshot of that, as I feel, is that had all these units been built, Thedford would have built a middle school, which might stand empty today. We would not have continued farming. We, the, the small acreage we had would not have served us for that, you know, to, to make a living, I do not believe. We would not have fed thousands of Upper, Fam Upper Valley residents, given away thousands of pounds of food to willing hands and hired hundreds of local teenagers to work on the farm. And today the farm is conserved. We no longer own it. We sold it about a year ago. It's conserved by the Vermont Land Trust and a young 37 year old farmer who was started working for us when he was 14 and then became a partner, owns what is a very successful vegetable farm. 
And this all occurred right on the edge of what you would characterize as a rural working lands area and the edge of Post Mills. Now, as chairs District 3, over the 11 years I chaired, we issued over 200 permits. We denied only 10 applications. Of the 10 denials, three were appealed. During this entire 11 years, there was never any applications which concerned housing. I think that might be of interest, except a section 6086B downtown project known as 132 South Main Street. It's a kind of hybrid process under 10 VSA 151 designed to expedite applications in downtown development districts. So this application is to show you, and it's in, in my testimony here that, that I've submitted, uh, took was received in um, December of 2019, and the date of decision was issued on 4-2-20, 104 days after receipt. And I've included um, a picture of that beautiful downtown building. It's five stories high. It's, I think it's really quite exciting. There's a Twin Pines project, um, which was a PHP, a priority housing exemption uh, on Sykes Avenue, which we never saw, but it's 30 units. Mm -hmm. And pre presently Simpson Development Corp has proposed 192 market units and 48 pri priority housing units in Hartford, which will be exempt under Act 250. So, I am strongly in favor of permitting municipalities to apply for and receive the quote, plan growth des area designation as proposed in H687. Um, this would exempt them from Act 250 review. I am greatly concerned, however, what remains, I'm sorry about my dog here. Let me shut the, the door yeah. shut. Your, your law clerk is acting up. Back. Yeah, yeah the, the neighbor neighbors skiing by. We um, one of the things I do in the winter is um, we uh, on our hundred acres here. We um, uh, I groom uh, 10, 10 k of ski trails, and he she wants to get out and go play with the dog. Anyhow, <laughs> um, I'm very very concerned that with the uh, exemption in either a tier one or however you want to characterize it that we will not we will lose this prior pri priority housing incentive so i i i encourage you in any bill you draft to include some kind of incentive uh for priority housing affordable workforce housing however you want to characterize it i think i think um that that is critical to this change um I'm also in favor of making permanent the Act 250 jurisdictional threshold for a permit from 10 units to 25 for downtowns, neighborhood development areas, village centers with zoning and subdivision laws, and growth centers as long as the projects do not impact critical resource areas, such as primary agricultural soils. Um, and I, I've mentioned the workforce housing. Um, I, I thought some excellent th thoughts came out today about legislation requiring towns to adopt subdivision. Well, actually this didn't come out, but this is something that I feel strongly about that it may be time for towns to have to this re be required to adopt subdivision and zoning bylaws. And we no longer would have the one acre towns. Um, and I'm strongly in favor of this concept of bottom up form of planning uh, to which Gus Selig alluded. Uh, and ultimately, um, I'm strongly in favor of the tiered approach to Act 250 review that I believe is in H687. I don't know if you all have had time to look at it. Um, I think Chair Sheldon and Representative Bongarts have done a wonderful job there. And finally, as climate change rages on, oh my gosh, this dog, why did she do this now? We need, we need to strike it's, a it's balance. It's okay. It's okay. It's kind okay, of good. Good. We need to strike a balance. Um, as climate change rages, we need to strike a balance, I feel, between building affordable housing, providing an equitable education, and preserving land to feed those who live in those homes and the children that attend those schools. Um, but I think you may have thought that I would be opposed to some of these recommendations that came out of the NRB uh, plan, but I think most of them are excellent. But Along with tier one, A or B, however you want to characterize it, we need to concentrate on the tier two and the tier three as well. We can't 
ignore yeah. them. One last final thing, and I include it. Just know you're going to be missing out on a lot of fees with these exemptions, potentially. We had yeah. four car dealerships. Yeah. yeah, we had four car dealerships come into Sykes Avenue in Hartford in my uh, years there. We had application fees of 125000 transportation fees of 41000 which went to help build the roundabout, yep. and offsite mitigation fees, which went to the Housing and Conservation Board of $34,000. These were all minors. We got them done in very short periods of time. So just be aware that you're going to be missing out on some fees potentially here. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. And thanks for <laughs> um, following up on the whatever you had in mind, you know, okay. exactly what we wanted to hear. Was it looking for any preconceived notion of testimony? So thank you for that. Um, okay. and, Personal privilege. Uh, yes, Sarah McCormick. Uh, this is Dick McCormick. I'm your your one of your predecessors as chair of District Three. And just greetings from the past. <laughs> and now one of your senators. Yeah, I know. I, I, I Jimmy knows that. <laughs> All three of your senators are here. Yeah, I so know you are, and I and I miss Mark too. Uh, oh, good to see you. There is Mark. <laughs> yeah, all four of us are here. <clears throat> Okay. Um, well, <laughs> thanks so much again for uh, your service on that board and all the innovative stuff you've helped make happen over your way. Yes, here, here. Okay. Thank so, you. Okay. And with that, we'll go to our next guest, which is uh, Brian Bannon, Zoning Administrator and Floodplain Manager for the Town of Brattleboro. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Bannon. Thanks for uh, joining us from my mom's hometown. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, and also, I would like to thank all the people who worked on these studies this summer um, and winter. Uh, they've done really great work and are really helpful that it will empower small towns like Brattleboro do our work and encourage the development of more housing. Uh, Brattleboro is short 500 housing units immediately, and on a longer term, we're short 1,000 units. We're also a community of modest incomes and many people are rent stressed and mortgage stressed. So doing housing that people can actually afford, tremendous challenge, heroic work, and any risk that we can reduce, any fee that we can cut back will help. Focusing on our developed areas allows us to make the most of our tax dollars. We can increase the use of our existing sewer, water, and road network. We can improve our public transportation. It creates opportunities for people to live and work in places where they can walk, where they don't have to have one car for every adult. Um, and this is what Vermont land law has been trying to encourage. Prosperous cities and villages and working landscapes. Bradwell would like to pursue a tier one for our sewer and water area. And we certainly have the capacity to do local review that's adequate and equal to what's done by Act 250. Uh, Proposal for tier three for precious and irreplaceable natural landscapes is fantastic. There has to be some areas that are just known to be off, off limits for development. And continued Act 250 jurisdiction for areas that are between the settled centers and working lands is appropriate and necessary to reduce sprawl. <clears throat> um, we have found that. Uh, some projects in our downtown were increased when the jurisdictional threshold was increased, and that's bringing you know, needed homes to people in our community. We also found that <clears throat> our upzoning and encouragement of mixed use development in centers has been a necessary part of hazard mitigation. To relocate homes out of flood hazard areas, there has to be some place to actually build and places where we encourage that building. The designated program has us look at areas at low risk outside of flood hazard and river corridor areas and encourage building higher densities. And this has allowed us to take place, people move people from floodplains where they've been repeatedly evacuated and faced flood damage in a tropical storm Irene and get them to a safe haven where they don't need to worry about flooding 
that we've seen this this year. <clears throat> I don't really have much more to say than that. Um, just thankful for the efforts to empower localities to make decisions from for our communities that are compatible with the framework for state planning goals. Thank you. Thank you, um, Brian. Uh, and you know, you have your senator here, Senator Harrison, who brought some of yes. us down to see your work on Melrose Terrace. With Melrose Terrace in mind, I think, you know, a great case study in getting lots of vulnerable seniors out of the floodplain. One of our takeaways was that it took several years because of permitting processes to relocate those seniors back in community. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Because that's our biggest concern is once we get people maybe on this side of the room, but once we get people out of floodplains, they need somewhere to go in short order and it took maybe seven years to relocate them. Yeah, it was challenging. Remember, we thought we had really pro-housing zoning um, and we worked with the uh, housing partnerships and Evernorth to find locations for a new building to help people find a safe place to live. And as we looked at our regulations and tried to work with them, we found that we didn't actually have zoning that actually worked with um, producing parcels that would actually support a affordable housing project. So we went back and we did some additional reforms and came a little bit closer. We um, we found a existing planned residential development and we were able to use that instrument to get a place for the people to build a replacement housing. But then we found that in fact, we had made an error and had uh, missed a density cap. Um, so we went back for a third round of of amendments to allow for more housing. We got rid of density caps for the number of dwelling units per acre in our developed areas. And that's proved really, really productive as far as allowing for the development of new units and existing buildings, as well as this new larger project. <clears throat> so what I would say is that when we look at regulations and regulatory reform to promote housing, it should be an iterative process and we should go back and test it periodically to see if it's actually achieving what we're looking for. For us, it wasn't. We wanted to have dense centers where people could walk and live and be safe. And it turns out we had really nice looking regulations, but didn't do that. So go back, test, have that be part of the process. See if we're actually creating lands and parcels that can be developed to meet our housing goals. Um, well, thanks. Can you just say a little bit, I, I want to make sure I heard it right. Uh, <clears throat> we've been hearing more about the um, like state level planning or RPC level planning, but the are you saying that the, the biggest impediment that you had in Brattleboro was um, attractive but not highly functional municipal planning? That's right. Um, you know, we had density levels and in theory that would produce, you know, 16 units per acre. And that sounded really good, but we didn't have very many large parcels in residential areas that would support a building with 55 units, which is what we needed. Um, those larger buildings are necessary to make an affordable, manageable project um, that will be viable long term. Um, but Again, we just didn't have those parcels. So it looked good in theory, but to achieve the density that we thought we could, it, it just didn't actually work. So we got rid of that density per acre cap and we just established um, kind of form-based code that allowed for buildings of a certain size on a parcel and the number of housing units that could be developed in those was whatever the developer thought practical as far as the size of units that were in demand. That actually produced the type of townscape that we were looking for, and it also allowed projects to be feasible and pencil out. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us from down there, and um, good to hear from the other end of the state, or up, uh, up here in Washington County. Great. Thank you. Of that, we're gonna go to um, Charlie Hancock, who's the chairman of the Montgomery Select Board, jumping from one end of the state to the other. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Hancock, good to see you again. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, again, my name is Charlie Hancock. I'm the uh, chairman of the Montgomery Select Board. 
um, though my day job is a consulting forester. Although sometimes it's hard to tell which one of those takes up more of my time. Mm. <laughs> um, I participated in the NRB report, um, which has already been touched upon many times today. And I'd like to echo others who have pointed to this as a compromise framework, which addresses so many of the challenges that we face and which we're discussing here today. And I want to emphasize um, the word compromise, um, because for our vision to actually work, the various components within that report really need to be considered as a package. And I think that's something that clearly came out of the work that we did together. Uh, Montgomery, which, as you mentioned, is tucked way up here at the northern end of the state is a rural community, like the majority of other towns in Vermont. Um, we have what I would consider really robust zoning, um, but we're currently working with our RPC to make our bylaws even stronger, addressing many of the challenges that you're all already aware of. We're also in the process of developing a municipal wastewater system for our village centers, a principal objective of which is to increase housing availability. Um, I should pause one second. I do have a couple slides I'd like to share. So if it's possible to enable the screen share, um, that would be excellent. So um, as a smaller rural community, our interaction with Act 250 looks a lot different than larger communities, which are addressing a scale of projects, which are frankly an order of magnitude larger than what we're looking at, but it does have a significant impact here. Um, one project I can point to is on a 16 acre parcel right in Montgomery Center, which is one of our two designated village centers where our town plan and zoning seeks to encourage dense, compact development, and which will be served by our wastewater project. Um, the parcel came under Act 250 jurisdiction nearly 20 years ago when the prior landowner began operating a small greenhouse on the site. Um, years of issues with one neighbor um, using Act 250 to tie them up into knots led the landowner to give up that enterprise and the parcel sat vacant for nearly two decades. Um, we now have a local developer, um, folks that actually live here in town with really deep roots in the community, looking to create a mixed commercial and residential development, which would result in over 35 units of new housing, specifically targeting workforce and seniors. But before they could even think of addressing any permitting, let alone Act 250, that same neighbor, neighbor got wind of the land transfer and their intent and went screaming to our district commission, which set the ball rolling in a manner which was very discouraging and frankly demoralizing. Um, in this case, Act 250 literally came to them. They didn't even have a chance to go to Act 250. Uh, since then, these guys have faced many of the same burdens you've already heard about today, so I, I won't go into them, but, you know, dealing with pre-existing permit conditions, increases in time and expense, duplication of permit efforts, and frankly, living with a heavy amount of fear. Um, this project is just one example of why the recommendations in the NRB report would provide permit relief for projects such as this in these areas where we do affirmatively seek to encourage growth and development and why um, following those recommendations is so important. Um, I also think it's important within the context of this conversation to highlight what we don't want housing development to look like. Um, what you're looking at here is a 90 acre parcel, 190 acre parcel in my own community of Montgomery. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this parcel, um, uh, this parcel, which it was historically managed as a working forest, sits within both the highest priority forest block, which connects this area of the J State Forest with the surrounding landscape, and within a highest priority connectivity area adjacent to Route 242. The land also serves as the headwaters and flood storage to a critical tributary of the Trout River, which passes right through Montgomery Center. We've talked about flooding many times today. Um, the land was purchased and subdivided into 15 building lots in a manner which managed to leapfrog Act 250 jurisdiction in terms of timing, avoiding that 1055 trigger. This led to no opportunity for review or an opportunity to address design potentials, which would negate the impacts which we're looking at. So now we're looking at um, a road system approximately 3,500 feet in length or about 0.6 miles, 15 acre, uh, 15, 12 acre building lots again, which managed to leapfrog any sort of review. Um, I highlight this because the road rule, which is included in the NRB report, would have addressed this. It would have provided a backstop to catch something like this and not to necessarily limit any development there, but to give an opportunity to design that development in a way which can mitigate the impact on these resource concerns. And we'll note that the property currently is for sale. The developer ended up pulling the plug on the project. So you can see the development that went on as far as the roads and the building lot infrastructure. 
but nothing was actually built up there. Um, so we're currently seeking a conservation buyer to come in and buy that and to keep it intact as a working forest. So if any senators have $1.8 million lying around, <laughs> please, <laughs> please give me a call. Um, so uh, big picture, um, uh, big picture, I think we need to advance a balance like what's proposed in the NRB report with exemptions and designated areas and resource protection, or at least the simple opportunity to review development in these areas um, that are so critical for, for resource concerns. Without relief in designated areas, I think we'll continue to see development in communities like Montgomery being pushed out of these, these designated centers and constructed in a way which bypasses review similar to what we just looked at. We're seeing fragmentation of our forests, of these critical lands, not just occurring, but rapidly accelerating. And that's really concerning on a multitude of levels. Lastly, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to highlight the connection between economic development and housing in communities like ours, and the need to address permit relief for working lands businesses, such as farm and forest enterprises. Tim spoke earlier about the importance of Act 250 in maintaining our land base, but I'd like to highlight that it's the success of these enterprises themselves, which are foundational to maintaining the landscape that Act 250 seeks to protect and the rural communities like ours, which depend on them. These working lands are what defines us as a state, and frankly, there are days when I fear that we're forgetting that. We often speak about resilience, and resilience in this context means economic viability. In order for these farms and forest enterprises to continue to feed communities and steward the lands for the multitudes of benefits they provide, they must be economically viable. This means supporting diversified income streams, adding value through secondary processing, and building infrastructure to increase efficiency of operations and embrace the opportunity for these enterprises to be partners as we consider natural climate solutions. Act 250 often stands in the way of this. The NRB report identified one potential solution or one step in the right direction, which would be lowering the ag soils mitigation ratio to one to one for forest processing enterprises. This is the same ratio we currently give industrial parks. I think this is a great start, but I think that more is needed and I would really welcome the opportunity to discuss, to discuss that further with you. And so with that, I will end my testimony. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Hancock. I, you know, I'll, I think you'll hear from Senate Natural Resources and Energy in part because we, uh, I'll express a personal concern and or in interest. We are, we are the, today the focus is housing. And so that's drawn us to look most uh, like at tier one, for instance. Um, and I don't want us to uh, find that we're giving short shrift to the natural environments that are out in you know, like tier here. two or tier three. You know, and, um, so I, that's my own ignorance on how this might roll out, but the concern I want to, so you've highlighted yes. um, that for us and that's helpful. Uh, His road rule photos are fabulous. Those are like totally illustrate the challenge that, and the battle we've had. And those were in the legislature. Charlie, mm -hmm. can you clarify exactly what loophole or window was taken advantage of with the 1055 what what time period that was yeah so i i some of this predated me um being okay. in the community but my understanding is that the subdivision of the lots occurred in a time frame where they managed to do it over 15 or 16 years and so that 10 year window kind of lapsed oh. and separated and so they basically just leapfrogged it they, they did, I don't know exactly how many they did in what framework, but they did yeah. just enough not to trigger Act 250 and then went back and did the rest right after that window had passed. That's an interesting That's conundrum. The RPC. Yeah. Hey, well, good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming in. And Great. Thank you so much. Take care. That, uh, Chair? Yes, um, I have the privilege of introducing uh, a friend and personal hero, uh, Jessica Dandridge Smith, by way of context, just to embarrass her a little bit more, um, we met as part of the inaugural class of the USA Obama leaders. And while we all showed up to Chicago as equals, um, some people were just a cut above the rest in terms of walking the walk at the intersection of social and environmental justice. And I think there's probably no city we can learn more from than New Orleans. And, um, you know, as somebody in Jessica's work who uh, has been fighting for the heart of New Orleans and for those least uh, 
at the table, at least represented. Um, there's almost no one I can think of that could speak more to this really big vision of exactly what Seth um, pointed out. When you have a climate crisis and a housing crisis taken together, you get an equity crisis. Um, so Jessica's a big thinker, and I'm really grateful she could join us. And I'll probably take an embarrassing picture to show all of our Obama <laughs> leaders. That's fine. Thank you, Keisha, for the wonderful introduction and a wonderful, I've been listening in since this morning and so many wonderful thoughts and ideas and many of the people are um, spot on in terms of the challenges as well as the solutions. Um, and I know I do have 10 minutes. So I will try my best to be brief. <laughs> I, I could probably talk about this all day long. And again, thank you all for having me. I'm very honored to be invited and speak to you all and hopefully provide some insights and inspiration as well as provide some solutions for some of the challenges you all have been facing. Um, as you all know, Louisiana is no stranger to the climate crisis and in every single uh, map of the climate crisis globally, Louisiana is on the front lines of that and is predicted to be partially, if not um, two thirds of it underwater by 2050. Um, with that being said, I'm born and raised in the state of Louisiana, particularly in New Orleans, Louisiana. My family is multi-generational and with that multi-generational um, bloodline here, that means that many, every generation dating back to my great grandmother has dealt with an immense flooding and loss. Um, so growing up in the city of New Orleans, flooding is very common. We are at Delta, we're below sea level, and we have the largest pumping system in the world, over 99 pumps to keep the city moving and thriving and going. Uh, we also have the largest port system in the world um, combined, right? So we have five of the largest ports and most of the products that come from the Suez and Panama canals come up our Mississippi River um, and then is moved along many different states and highways. And you guys probably know a lot about that as well as ports. Um, so that being said, we're surrounded by water. And so our livelihood is attached to it. And that means that our economy is based on it, whether it be ports, shipping, oil and gas and energy, uh, as well as food production and so on. With our lush waterways also comes with a lot of pain. And so my family have experienced flooding from Hurricane Betsy to Camille. And in my first experience, direct experience with Hurricane Katrina, which hit the day before my 16th birthday. So I lived through many of the things that you all are talking about um, over 10 years ago, and now almost 20 um, if, you're, if you're counting. Um, and I've learned a lot in that process. I started as a youth organizer uh, in 2006 to really figure out what does it mean to live in a city that is dealing with the ideas of redevelopment, rebuilding, and all of the challenges from housing, food insecurity, homelessness, um, and also redefining resilience. Resilience was placed on us as well and the idea that people in Louisiana could deal with uh, the challenges because we've dealt with them for so long uh, since the French and the Spanish came. So I'm saying all that to say that we have a long history and with that comes a deep understanding of collective trauma around policies. And so when we talk about resilience in Louisiana, it is oftentimes attached to this concept. Um, my organization was kind of born out of that. And so 2014, um, a, a document called the Urban Water Plan, which is actually uh, just made 10 years, actually, it's, it's in a, we celebrated an anniversary event not long ago. Um, that document was kind of, I would like, say, our, our holy grail or our Bible around uh, resilience and, and green infrastructure and re-understanding or re-engineering our landscape to learn how to live with it. One of the reasons why Louisiana continually floods is not just because we're at Delta, because indigenous communities along the Mississippi River had been living there for over 5,000 years. It was because we decided to build slab on grade. It's because we decided to pave over many of the uh, wetlands and coastal areas. And we also decided to pump. All of those things created a, a deep amount of subsidence, flooding, and nowhere for water to go. Um, that was the result of Hurricane Katrina where the levees had failed. There was nothing on the inside of the bowl known as New Orleans to take on that amount of water. And thus you have a massive and still one of the, the uh, United States largest, most expensive uh, natural disasters uh, in, in, the, in the history uh, thus far. Um, I've been working in this space, as I mentioned, for a long time. And just to give additional context, I am a commissioner uh, for the state of Louisiana for the uh, Coastal Protection Restoration. And I am also the co-chair of the National Academy of Sciences Engineering on Resilience. So I'll leave you guys with a few different things. My organization does quite a few things and mainly focusing on education and policy, as well as advocacy 
and workforce development. So we do uh, many things and we have over 12 programs running from lead line abatement, um, as well as uh, community engagement frameworks for the state of Louisiana. Um, since last year in 2023, there's been an over $23 billion in natural disasters. 90% of those were caused by flooding globally. That has also increased uh, flood insurance, which in some areas has gone over 300%. And in homeowners insurance in states like Florida, Louisiana, and California no longer have it. And our last option of resort is the state insurance plan, which is not properly funded. If there were a disaster today, most Louisiana residents would be unable to rebuild, leading to a mass challenge around equity, around housing, and around just general rebuilding. Where do you go if you have no tax base? What does a state do if they lose half its population? In fact, the climate crisis is so bad in Louisiana that we rank fifth and highest amount of people that have lost residents across uh, the entire country. We are ranking in the middle between cities that have extremely high uh, uh, cost of living. And our issue isn't cost of living. Our issue is the ability to live through floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, drought, and heat waves. So I leave you with something that I always think about, which is the four R's of resilience. Resilience is not a catch-all term. It should be considered a four-level term, or there are four R's under that term. One, you need resources, and you guys are probably very well, well aware of that. And by resources, it's not just financial. Resources is people, people power, skills, and knowledge. The second thing is redundancy. One of the reasons why Katrina was such an epic failure was that there was no redundancy in the system. There was only so many, and I say so many, about three agencies that were uh, the go-to for natural disasters. That's the other issue. You need to be able to have community and neighborhood support that can provide resources necessary for resilience. Then that redundancy and those resources need to be done rapidly. They need to be directly of supporting communities as quickly as the event has happened. Uh, FEMA is actually, we as a part of the National Academy's Resilience Roundtable and as a part of a, a, a coalition of folks in Louisiana, the FEMA's new policy change about giving families money immediately was something that the state of Louisiana had been lobbying for for a long time. So I'm glad they have heard that, but it's not just FEMA. You cannot just depend on that. And I think you guys are fully aware of that. And lastly is robustness. They have to be big and far reaching and overarching, innovative and multidisciplinary ideas around these concepts. They cannot fully depend on green and they cannot fully depend on gray. They have to be in multifaceted ideas of solutions that are brought to the table for resilience. All of that to say that in order to tackle housing, which Louisiana did not do, particularly New Orleans, New Orleans did not have a housing problem pre-Katrina. Post Katrina, 20 years later, we're still missing 40,000 housing units. What has that done? That has caused a housing crisis where most of the housing stock has doubled in value, even though the housing stock is lower in quality because of so many natural disasters. We are in a conundrum where we can't even get insurance for our homes because most insurance companies deem us too risky, not because of flood vulnerability, but because of the challenges around our housing stock being too old and not willing to or able to withstand climate disasters. So we are looking at a multifaceted amount of solutions, but with those four R's in mind, you have to invest in green infrastructure and coastal restoration. There is no way forward. And particularly for Louisiana, where half the state is a floodplain, we don't have another option. I'm also on a climate migration a working group in caucus, which I'm actually working with Harvard University on to figure out what does it mean to move people during when it's no other option left. And I can tell you that the solution is not easy. In reality, it's not achievable in a planable way. How do you find a receiving community that's willing to take communities that no longer can live in that space? And what does it mean for your tax base? If you all are elected officials and half your community has to leave because of floodplain, what does that mean for your state and how does it move forward? What are the economics of that? What are the housing challenges around that? It is easier in, in terms of trauma as well as economic development to live with your ecosystem than to force millions of people to leave and go somewhere else. 
Louisiana was the first experiment in that, not just in Katrina, but a concept called Ile de Jean Charles, which the indigenous communities of that area have deemed an epic failure. You have to root your work in all of this, I should say, and I repeat this over and over again in community voice. It has to be a situation where communities are not just at stakeholders at the end of the design, but they are with the process from beginning to end. Additionally, community members are more than equipped to deal with policy challenges and are able to create policy that is best for their communities and their neighborhoods. I'll use the very short example that we're creating the first ever community-led stormwater utility fee uh, for New Orleans because we don't have one. And the community members wrote it with us, the organization and the agencies involved in water management mm -hmm. and elected officials from beginning to end, learning about green debt financing, bonds, and so on. And so there is a way forward, but it's going to require those four R's. It's going to require new multidisciplinary thinking. It has to be rapidly done. It has to be robust. It has to be redundant. To do all of that, it needs to have community at every single level. Otherwise, when there is a natural disaster, when there is a flooding event, or when you have a housing shortage, you will be in a situation that New Orleans is still digging itself out of almost 20 years later. And so I, I would love to go into like really deep details <laughs> about all the things that we do and the technicality, but I wanted to leave you all with an overarching concept and I'd be happy to dive deep at another time when it is appropriate. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jessica. And I, you know, I would recommend people look at all the stories uh, that you've collected of your work with communities. I think it's such a sobering and powerful look at when water is your source of trauma and your source of livelihood that you shared and all the systems you have to think about um, when, when considering that. So thank you so much for everything you do. And I know you're a thought partner of mine and I think um, hopefully for our work as we move forward. And we just really appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for joining us. Um, it's a sentimental note, not really relevant to what we're doing, but my daughter was married in New Orleans. And when I spent time there, I said, a, a, a remarkable and beautiful place. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I had just remind myself to say Jessica Dandridge Smith because the yes, weekend yes. after our Obama leaders convening, uh, Jessica got married. Oh, oh that's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I am a newlywed and also got married and recently gotten married in the world. So I'm very happy for your daughter. <laughs> she had a wonderful experience. It's a great place to visit and and uh, hopefully we could be here for another 300 years. Uh, so that more people can get married in this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think we all need to be like in Southeast uh, Asia. Inspiring to make up excuses to return. Yes. All right. yes. So thank you again. Um, thank we you. are going to continue taking testimony. And uh, our next guest is uh, Andrea Morganti, a former select board member in Hinesburg. And uh, Ms. Morganti, thank you for making the trip and joining us here today. Good to see you. Um, thank you for um, allowing me to share my experiences of um, living in what was a rural community. Um, I like to say that when I moved to Heinsburg in 1970 to a 200-year-old farmhouse, I lived on the edge of the historic village. I now live in the middle of the village. Um, and I'm very, very proud and glad to be able to do that. I can walk to my grocery store, I can walk to the hardware store, um, I can walk to town hall. Um, I now have uh, 24, soon to be 26 units, rental units on the hill above me that was the pasture that the cows grazed on. Um, just over that hill is another 24 units of senior housing with 24 more units being built. Um, so there'll be 48 units. Um, and uh, standing on the top of the hill, looking down on the elderly housing, I look across at um, 80 units of uh, condominiums. All of these were built in the late 1980s. Um, high and dry on the um, east side of Route 116, if you're familiar with Heinsburg at all. Route 116 is the state highway that bisects the town. Um, Heinsburg was a manufacturing town. 
Uh, we hosted one of the, the second largest uh, cheese factories in in the town, uh, right in the village. I could look out my my window at the cheese factory. Uh, milk from all over the state, kind of lower quality milk, uh, came to our cheese factory. We have a sewage treatment plant in our town because we had a we had a. Um, cheese factory, and because we became the uh, receiving town for a regional high school in the late 1960s. So as the Clean Water Act was being enacted and there was federal funding for building a sewage treatment plant, Hinesburg benefited greatly from uh, being able to address um, water quality. Most of the houses in the village were um, farmhouses with the farmland extending to the west, which was um, heavy clay soils. So 116 goes on a, on a, a geological um, hard bedrock um, ridge, which um, provided you know good resource. And all the development that happened in the 1980s, um, <clears throat> we were encouraging compact growth trying to do that and at the same time preserving our farmland. Um, we benefit from being at the southern edge of Chittenden County. Sometimes we like to think that we might be the northern edge of Addison County and maintain some of our rural lifestyles. Um, we have worked very hard to have compact growth and settlement within our village. And we were able to achieve that because we did have water and sewer. But none of that water and sewer um, served the, um, was connected to the housing in the lowland that had been ag land that was heavy clay soils, very similar to and the same as in Addison County. The cheese factory burned and it was a major, the major employer in town and um, the major user and the way that we afforded our sewer treatment plant. They paid at least 75% of the costs of our sewage treatment plant. Along the way, we were, the sewage treatment plant was a, um, we, we had to upgrade it always to meet the new phosphorus requirements. And um, we finally got the cheese factory to build some pre-treatment plants because the easiest way for them to deal with overflows at the cheese factory was to just send them to the town. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody remembers driving through Heinsburg in the 1970s and 1980s, we were known as the smelly town. <laughs> pretty bad. Um, and so um, we're now faced, uh, so we've worked very hard at revising our zoning. And I will provide some written testimony after hearing what everybody has had to say today. Um, but just want to explain the nature of relying on municipal regulations um, and the importance that Act 250 has um, played in addressing issues that um, a municipal town of our size has not really been able to address. Um, we've worked on doing the zoning to increase the density and to show on paper what looks like perfectly developable land. Um, what we have not done is recognize, and, and I see this time and again in our references to Act 250 and to regulations and to neighborhood development areas, is to recognize the really important ecological services that need to be maintained and act as prevention for flooding and for allowing um, wildlife to continue through our riparian corridors. We can't think about compact villages and settlement patterns and in our minds picture 19th and 20th century villages because we have seen the result of those settlements. In Hinesburg, we never had any flooding issues because it was farmland on the west side of town. And those farm fields were highly productive farmlands because they did flood 
because the sediment settled there and provided the nutrients to grow really good crops. Um, we thought we adopted regulations that would protect people from flooding. Um, oftentimes our regulations regarding rivers and streams have um, sought to protect the houses in the property. They have not been written to protect the systems that think about the watershed and water resources in the whole. And so our regulations that are adopted by municipalities to address flooding and river corridors are parochial. They are determined by who owns that land that looks like it's really well could be developed. But our mobile home parks were developed on oftentimes throughout the state um, on the least productive land, the leftover land, which we've seen are the lands that flood. Hinesburg has three mobile home uh, parks, um, which actually happen to be up on the high and dry areas, but their problem was that they didn't have potable water. And so we expanded our water line to give them potable water. They still don't have the best septic systems and we can't really do that. So um, I would just like to say that our concept of what a compact village and settlement pattern needs to recognize our opportunities for prevention. We have a small river, the La Platte River. Um, uh, I oftentimes joke that the source of the La Platte River is the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> there is almost as much water flowing and with the future development that is predicted, flowing into our sewage treatment plant from the, the homes than there is from the natural um, rivers and streams that flow there. We've worked really hard in the town of Hinesburg to conserve land with the help of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board with the Vermont Land Trust. We've conserved thousands of acres for farmland and forest land. We're at a very interesting geographic place um, within the state of having excellent forests and excellent farmland. Um, the situation that we're in is that uh, recently through the development review process, um, housing over the last um, 15 years has been allowed within what had been farmland and through a series of loopholes I'm calling them loopholes, um, between how we regulate wetlands and river corridors, houses have been built in the floodplain. July, we didn't see too, well, we had a hundred year storm event. It didn't impact people's houses because they were sitting on fill. And the regulations were, if you build your house one foot above the base flood elevation, you're protecting that house. But what is happening is that our public infrastructure is being flooded because the water has no place to go. Um, there is currently a new proposal to add on to this development that was built like 15 years ago of adding additional fill that was allowed in our regulations because our regulations deal with the statement about additional fill within the floodplain is it can create no undue adverse impact. The state regulations call for no adverse impacts. There was constant testimony given at the Development Review Board to recognize that this was not going to meet the Act 250 criteria, but it got approved anyway. And we in Hinesburg want to encourage housing. We've adopted inclusionary zoning, which private developers have reluctantly added into their projects, but always finding a way of shoving those housing units or apartments or rental off to the side. Um, I urge you to think about this tier one designation by assuring that municipal regulations can at least meet the standards that are recognized within Act 250. 
The same thing happens with stormwater regulations, is that the stormwater regulations look at a particular development. What we're missing is understanding how these ecological systems are functioning to prevent um, bad situations, to prevent the flooding, and that we can use them. So I urge you, as we're thinking about tier one, that we recognize the important ecological services that are being, um, that are functioning. So prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, of uh, remediation or whatever that expression is, right? <laughs> it's like an ounce of prevention. Um, I also have um, a, accumulated a fair amount of knowledge of, of watersheds uh, beginning um, in the late 1980s by recognizing that we need to think about our rivers and streams beyond <laughs> boundaries and by um, initiating efforts to create watershed organizations. And so we have the data. It's really important that, that you both committees are sitting here because it's not an either or, <clears throat> it's a both and. We can have these vibrant villages, but we might in the middle have this really protected floodplain. So we have two villages and you know maybe it's a 20 minute walk and not a 10 minute walk between them. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and give part. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, our final guest of the morning, uh, Close out the meeting is Nicole Maloney of uh, Moortown. Good morning, and thank you for beaming in from Moortown. Good morning. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, and to both Jessica and Andrea, I just caught both their testimonies. They are so on point and so valuable. So thank you both for um, sharing that. I'm very much in line with both of what those women said. Um, so I'm here to share my experience as a lower income community member navigating this nearly impossible housing market. Uh, I'm a local librarian here in Moortown. I'm also an artist and entrepreneur. I've had my own business for 10 years. I'm a manual laborer, a community organizer. I sort of just am. Um, and I am finding it very hard to live here. Um, it's, it's been, I've been living in unsafe and insecure housing for three years now. And despite my best efforts, I have found little to no relief, um, and have actually found myself being less resourced and less effective as a community member because of this experience. And I know that this is, I mean, this is the case when we're being faced with insecure housing, we cannot live up to our full potential. Um, and we're, we're just, we're carrying a very heavy burden right now. Um, so, it, and it tells us, you know, people in my position that we're, we're not valued and we're undeserving of safe housing. And uh, I'm just, yeah, we're, we're very unsatisfied with the resources available. Um, so my story definitely has something to do with scarcity of housing as well as flooding and other environmental factors that are, is more, it, it is impacting those of us who are vulnerable um, in a different way than property owners. But it also has to do with neglect, abuse of power, a disregard for the health and safety of tenants by those who are resourced enough and have the privilege of housing others. Um, so my particular situation, I've been stuck living in my the same living situation for three years now in Moortown Village. It's a multi-unit tenant building. Um, it's also been the lowest point uh, of a floodplain. Uh, it's a wonderful community. I love this village. I'm, we're surrounded by nature. Everyone is just, my neighbors are fantastic. I love being able to walk to li the library to work. But the building I live in um, is has been neglected for decades. It's one of the many aging houses in Vermont. Um, so... <laughs> It's, it's owned by someone who can only be described as an absentee landlord who owns many properties in the same state of disrepair, whose only objective seems to be to maximize profits, minimize spending on property maintenance, and who targets vulnerable people um, as tenants that they can intimidate. What I just said is textbook definition of a slumlord. 
Uh, there's no meaningful effort to safely house people in this building or any of his buildings. And this is not a unique situation. This is this is happening all over Vermont and the nation. Um, but it's a serious issue because there's not a lot a tenant can do in these situations and we don't have a lot of other options. So just an overview, this is a non-exhaustive list of the conditions here, but there is inconsistent access to utilities such as heat, running water, internet, electricity, so forth. Um, this landlord hasn't paid any of his bills, so the, the electricity is constantly getting shut off. Uh, we were flooded back in December, which affected our water pump. So this whole month, I've had inconsistent access to running water for you know days, weeks at a time. Um, now we're dealing with freezing pipes because there's a hole blown through the basement from where it flooded, insulations on the floor, huge risk of electrical fire. Um, there's... <laughs> Many infestations happening. There's rats in the walls. There's carpenter ants. There's squirrels. Um, there's a whole system of tunnels in the yard where you're just sinking into it. So, you know, the structural integrity is up for debate. There's mold everywhere uh, in mostly, you know, where we can't see it, but, you know, in the ceilings, in the basements, in the walls. Um, drafts, inoperable doors and windows and other just major health and safety violations that have been confirmed by our health town health officer, by the um, fire marshal, as well as the state, because we have been to court over this uh, over a year ago. This man is currently $200 in, um, in debt and fines. He's accrued that much in fines over the past year and has done absolutely nothing to remedy any of this. Um, so that's the situation. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah, five hundred. He's been getting fined five hundred dollars a day since February <laughs> to coerce him to address some of these issues, which he has not done. So that's the condition that I'm living in, and you know, it's very stressful. It's very stressful when you can't take a shower, you can't wash your dishes, the heat's not working. My downstairs neighbor hasn't had heat for five years, so she usually comes and showers in my apartment because um, she has no hot water either. And, and we're, we're sick, we're, we're all unwell here. Um, and we're also, the rent, we don't pay, we have to pay our own utilities and the rent is already $1,200, um, which is more, that is three fourths of my income. So it's just, it, this is not, this is violence. This is an extreme case of violence. There is nothing else we can do. Even if there was other places to go, the current rate of the market, we can't afford it. We're, we're grown adults who all have full-time jobs. I mentioned I'm a librarian. We have a postal worker who lives here. We have someone who works in voting. We have a um, construction worker. I mean, we are we are the people that live here. Um, so um, what else? I have my little list of notes over here. So I think... The biggest frustration here is I've I've gone down every avenue of legal aid, capstone, community funds. There's just not a lot of people. And there's not a lot that can be done that is a meaningful long term situation. You know, maybe they can help pay a bill here or there, but there's no. You know, this is not sustainable, um, and it's unacceptable that these landlords or people that are in these positions that are responsible for housing others are able to operate like this and collect. You know, any sort of government aid that you know isn't available to tenants anything that is a resource for tenants actually goes to the landlord whether it's rental assistance or grants or whatever the tenants themselves have no autonomy um, because i've tried i've tried to apply for grants to fix my my roof but unless the landlord is participating there's there's no relief um and and i know that my landlord has collected state funds when irene came because this building was flooded to the second floor he did nothing with it. He took it. Not a lot has been done since then. Um, and he just, he preys on people that, <clears throat> that are desperate. So, you know, this is about, this is a very unique case. This is about an individual who's acting this way, but this is also about the system that allows this to happen, regardless of how many laws exist to protect tenants. They, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because our only option is to leave. And that in and of itself is an incredibly large investment, not only emotionally, but financially to pack up your life, move out of your home 
and find somewhere else to go. Where in my case, if I left this village, I would have to get a new job. I would have to build a new community and support system. Like this is, I am part of this community. Um, and, you know, we're also facing, you know, food is unaffordable along with the cost of labor or the like cost of services or, you know, building materials for me to be able to house myself in a meaningful way. I, I just, it's inaccessible. It's a large, it's a huge issue. And so I really appreciate what Jessica was saying about this being a community issue. If we want to house our community members, it needs to be, the burden needs to be carried by more than just the individual, because this is not working. Um, you know, we also have the oldest housing stock in the country. And if nothing changes in the way that we are able to maintain these homes, we're going to lose houses as fast as we're able to build them. And I, and just like Andrea was saying, is that what we, re what we really want is to build all these new units when we have perfectly viable housing already available? Um, but just the way that, you know, tenant landlord relationships work, it's, it's medieval. We have no, we have no way of actually safely and securely housing ourselves, which I know most of us are willing to do. We want to be able to play an active role in housing ourselves. Um, speaking of, there is plenty of viable housing available right now. It's just not accessible. And it's because it's being used as short-term rentals where it is yes. occupied for a couple nights uh, a week for insane rates, you know, $300, $400 a night, which is not realistic. And then they're empty. They're completely vacant and they would be perfect housing opportunities for single people, artists, entrepreneurs like myself, small families, single moms. There, there's no reason. I mean, other than the fact that it's private property and it is up to those individuals to, to make those choices, whether they can afford it or not. I know a lot of people have these Airbnbs to sustain their own situation, but you know, if the state was putting their resources into those types of situations instead of the hotel motel situation, which is you know, short term and not really dignified for the people that are staying in those situations, I think we would be able to come together as a community and, you know, know each other and want to house each other and have it not just be this business transaction where landlords are literally just making their money off of taking the better part of our income as working people. Um, so I think I think that's my biggest point, that this is my situation. It's not unique. Um, I am so grateful for my support systems that have allowed me to sustain living in the situation. But I'm watching people just end up on the street because this is very hard to navigate. I have used so much of my time and energy and resources to advocate for myself and my fellow tenants, you know, going to select board meetings on the phone fighting bills, dealing with the, the psychological torment of having to deal with a human being who just has absolute disregard for everyone else. Um, and they're just, they're, they're responsible for all of this, yet we are carrying the burden. So I, I really urge you to continue to invite people like me uh, and other people in this situation Ooh. to help solve this problem because we want to, we want to be a part of this. We are frustrated that we don't have more autonomy and means to be a part of the solution well thank you so much for joining us and you know adding your really essential voice to the conversation just as we've been talking about mm, here you. from everyone it's a very complicated whatever ecosystem of people uh, uh, land owners landlords tenants and um, um people who are now <clears throat> Difficult position like yours, I think, are too often not at the table when we have the important. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole, I, ha I have spoken to the VBA because I think you'd mentioned uh, uh, needing some pro se pro bono help. And so we've got maybe have some help on the way with uh, the, v the Vermont Bar Association. So because your testimony was so compelling two weeks ago. <laughs> it was. So, Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that for, you know, it would be great to have some personal relief in this matter, but really considering this part of the puzzle that is creating 
such yeah. pressure on the right. housing market. Um, cause there's no way, I, I mean, the wages we make are the wages we wake, make. So unless everything is coming up to match the market, we're, we're going to be continually drained of our resources and not be able to house ourselves and have to rely more heavily on the systems. Um, that Thank we- you. Yeah. And you're speaking to an experience where a lot of people in your position don't have the time and the capacity and the wherewithal yeah. to speak to us. So you're representing one of the least heard and most important voices in this conversation. And I know that takes time that you don't have out of your mm-hmm. schedule. So we really appreciate this. And so much. <clears throat> you shouldn't be living in conditions like this in Vermont or the country. No no very- and I am so grateful that I do have a roof over my head. I know that I'm trying very hard to um, not rock the boat too much because everyone here right now has a roof. So we're not trying to condemn this building or be evicted with nowhere to go. So this is a very delicate situation. It, you know, we know we're living in danger, but it's better than being out in the elements, which is no one should be out there right now. We have enough housing to get these people under a roof. And that's, that's all I have to say. We need to do better to get them into safe housing and prioritize our community members before Mm -hmm. tourists or, you know, whoever it is that's renting here, here. short term we're right with you thank okay. you Nicole. so thank you <laughs> thank you everyone uh um thank you miss maloney for for bringing the the uh, the closure for the morning yeah. it's been a really uh, informative and helpful morning on lots of levels so uh thanks to my colleague general rob Hinsdale, for helping <laughs> put together a Joint meetings. But, well done, uh, you too. Yes, yeah, nice work. Yeah, good to have the two committees sitting together uh, doing. This. You know, we're so often. We know what it's like to be in a hearing that's yes, no, yes, no, um, and I'm just really heartened that we just heard a lot of agreement and a lot of the unmet need is shared work between us. So it's great. With that, we are Burlington's adjourned. Gonna-